one. Good afternoon and welcome to the Grand Prairie City Council meeting for July 13th, 2020. We will start our city council meeting uh, with the call to order and our national anthem as we always do. Oh, Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love in all of us command. With glowing hearts we see the rise, the true north strong and free. From far and wide, O oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. God, keep our land glorious and free. O oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. stand on guard for thee. Thank you to the National Film Board for the images of our country and to an alumni from our very own Grand Prairie Boys Choir for the audio. Um, we'll move into the adoption of our previous council meeting minutes and we have uh, two different sets of minutes. We'll start with uh, Councillor Minhas. Councillor Minhas. Thank you very much, Mayor Gavin, and uh, move the council adopt the minutes of the city council meeting held on Monday, June 29, 2020, as presented. Okay, thank you, Councillor Minhas. Any discussion or debate on that set of minutes? Are there any errors or omissions we need to correct before we adopt them? Seeing nothing, then I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Thank you, that's unanimous, thank you. Um, and we have a meeting, uh, special council meeting minutes. Council Minhas, you want to do that one as well? I move the council adopted the minutes of city council meeting, special meeting held on Wednesday, 8th, July 8th, 2020, as presented. Thanks, Council Minhas. Any discussion or debate on that set of minutes? <laughs> Again, seeing none, then I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Thank you, that motion carries unanimously. Um, and then we have the adoption of the agenda. We have one additional item that's gonna bump a couple of rounds. Councilor Bress, I think you're prepared to make that motion for us. Yeah, Mayor Given, I would move that council amend the agenda by adding 7.1 supportive housing proposal and changing the current item 7.1 to item 7.3 and then uh, accept the agenda as adopted, or sorry, as amended. Okay. Okay. That's great. Thanks, Councillor Bressy. So just so everybody's keeping score, <laughs> uh, Councillor Bressy's motion that was uh, 7.1 has been replaced with supportive housing, and his motion is now moved on to seven item 7.3, just so everybody's keeping track. Any discussion or debate on the agenda? Again, seeing none, then I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? You. That motion carries unanimously. Um, and that brings us into the delegation portion of our agenda. Um, I know that we have a number of delegations. Um, we'll first go through the ones that let us know in advance that they wish to be coming before we get into others. I know that there are others that have joined us today. Uh, we'll start first with uh, 5.1, and I believe we had a delegation representing Bandage Paws. And so if you're here from Bandage Paws, I'd ask you to invite you now to turn on your camera and your microphone. Um, hello, hello there. Um, and with all of our delegations, we'll ask you to keep your presentation to about five minutes um, because we do have a pretty packed agenda today and we will have an opportunity for any questions from council following that. Okay, welcome. 
Yeah, thanks for having us today. Um, we wanted to discuss with you, um, well, first I'll give you a brief his history on Vanish Pauses in case you're not familiar. Um, so we've been around since 2000, 2012. We were a volunteer organization, um, completely foster based. Uh, last year, we moved into the facility uh, next to the Grand Prairie Regional Pound, um, and we've had a large amount of growth since we've moved in. Um, in the first six months of our, our year into the facility, we increased or we doubled our intakes from our previous year. So last year, we had 903 animals come into our care, um, and it's not slowed down since. Um, so, so far in 2020, we have had uh, 500 and 35 animals come in and 236 of those were actually from the city directly. Um, and yes, there was 31% from the pound. Uh, and then we had 39% of our owner surrenders and 30% were just stray animals that came in. So we currently have a great relationship with the regional pound, um, but today we're looking to kind of discuss the possibility on building on that. We've uh, been in talks with the county um, about uh, a long-term partnership, and we're hoping that both the city and the county will want to join us on that um, to, in a more detailed partnership with the regional pound. Uh, so in 2020, we've had only 20% of our animals in total come from the regional pound. That's partly due to us uh, with the pandemic, the pound was closed for a period of time. And we kind of stepped in to take some animals um, as they had their doors close to the public and there was still a great need there. So the animals came directly to us instead of through the pound. Um, stray animals make up 42% of that we've seen this year and 33 owner surrenders as a whole, um, not just within the city. Um, so we do have a standard uh, transfer fee that comes with the pound animals, that's $100. And we do have a, uh, a surrender fee with animals uh, that are owner surrenders, that is $100 as well. Um, there is exceptions to that if uh, the individual does have troubles paying it or something like that. Um, so there is extenuating circumstances, of course. Um, and then we've been in talks directly with the regional pound and they are hoping, they've expressed interest to move back to their normal mandate, which is animal control, um, thus closing their adoption side and their owner surrender side. Um, this is something Bandage Paws would be willing to take on moving forward for um, all of the city residents and county as well. Um, so we've, uh, from our understanding, the pound was just doing it since 2016 when the SBCA closed. Um, they kind of stepped in to fill that void that the SBCA um, was, was previously taken care of. Um, so kind of that's where we're looking to come into the picture now. Um, in order to accomplish this, um, our thoughts are to have all the owner surrenders come through us and then we would direct all the uh, strays to the pound and then they would be transferred to us if they were not reclaimed by owners. Um, and then, yeah, so basically what we're looking for is to see today if the city of Grand Prairie would be willing to um, open this partnership with us and the county of Grand Prairie um, to further have discussions about the specifics of what an agreement like this would look like uh, to continue to help us to help the community and the animals uh, while remaining financially stable um, and assisting the regional pound on getting back to their original mandate of um, just doing animal control. Um, in order to account for a higher volume of animals, uh, we would need to have more staffing to uh, account for the additional cost per animal as well and require kind of a set amount per year opposed to an animal transfer fee as we're currently doing. Um, so that's kind of, I guess there's a, there's a lot of further discussion needed for that one, but just kind of wanted to get it on the table and, and get any thoughts or questions you guys might have on it or further information that uh, you need to kind of from us to make a decision like this. Hey, I appreciate uh, I appreciate you being uh, direct and concise. Um, one, 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 <laughs> no, you got the point. That's awesome. One thing though that I did I did a bad job of giving you sort of the lay of the land to start. I didn't ask you to introduce yourselves, and so if uh, <laughs> yeah, if I skipped that portion a lot. Yeah, no problem. And then we'll go to council members with any questions. Uh, I'm Natasha. I'm the executive director with Banish Paws. And I'm Danica. I'm the financial coordinator. Great. Thanks very much to, to both of you. So, uh, any questions for the delegation? Councillor O'Toole. Yeah, thank you for being here. Uh, I've been to your facility and uh, brought some donations in a few times, uh, blankets and pop bottles. Uh, is the facility gonna be big enough for the role that you're gonna be taking over? 
Um, we shouldn't have an issue there um, because it's kind of built for this. Um, there is a lot of space um, for dogs and cats, and we also do run still out of foster homes. So we do utilize uh, a lot of volunteer work in the community as well. Um, foster homes being a big portion of that, we're usually, it uh, depends on the, the year or the time of year we're at, but anywhere from 80 to 100 animals are typically in foster care as well, which is, uh, it's fairly large compared to what uh, the former SBC was doing in terms of a foster care program. Um, so we're keeping that heavy because it's, it's really, it's better for the animals and it costs less. <laughs> so. Bonus. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Councillor O'Toole. Any other questions for the delegation? Um, I just had one. Um, so I uh, understand that you had been working with the County of Grand Prairie. Have you had any conversations with city uh, management or administration yet? Uh, we did talk with um, uh, Kelly from Bylaw, and we did talk with him and Stu Rempel and Kim uh, from the county. Uh, when was it? Just two weeks ago-ish? Yeah. Not too long ago. So just shortly after we met with the county council. Okay. okay that's great. Um, I don't see anybody with any other questions, so I guess that's the end of the presentation, just in terms of how our agenda works. Um, so we're way up here on item, what are we, item 5, your 5.1, and we deal with our delegation business under item 10. Uh, you're more than welcome to stay on the line, uh, watch the rest of the council meeting, um, or uh, if you weren't able to do that, obviously, um, if there are any council motions on this topic, our administration, our management will get back to you. Um, and so you're welcome to join us. Um, but as you exit the council table, we just ask that you turn off your microphone, uh, turn off your video, and then uh, you're more than welcome to stick around for the rest of the meeting and, and uh, see how it goes when we get to the delegation business towards the end of the agenda. Okay, great. Thank you so much for your time. Great. Thank you both. Uh, so our next delegation that let us know ahead of time that they wish to present to council um, is the Council Remuneration Review Committee. I saw at least one representative uh, from that group. I don't know if there are others. Um, but anybody that was with the remuneration review committee, if you'd like to turn on your cameras, turn on your microphones and join us at the count virtual council table. Uh, there we go. I see a couple and uh, I can see uh, Ms. Martin, Ms. Sherbeck. Uh, I know Ms. Rice was there somewhere and I don't know uh, if you have anybody else joining you. I'm here in there, Lynn Corder. Thanks very much, Lynn. Uh, sorry, I had the non-video participant hidden, so I'll, I'll turn it back on so that I can see you and uh, see uh, Helen there as well. Okay, um, uh, Lynn, I think you were chairing the group, and so should I throw it to you to um, introduce the report you're presenting? Okay, thank you, Your Worship, and members of council for the opportunity to conduct this review. Uh, I'd like to thank the other members of the committee, Serge Martin, Helen Rice, and Greg Sherbach for their input and patience while we worked our way through this exercise. And on behalf of the committee, I offer a special thanks to Arlene, our city clerk, for all her guidance and assistance in order to make the impossible possible. The report contains two major recommendations uh, for your consideration. And I will, uh, I will read them just for the record. Council received this report for information and acknowledge that the Council Remuneration Review Committee has completed their work as requested. And number two, Council approved policy 100 being the Council Remuneration and Expense Reimbursement Policy as presented to take effect after the municipal election schedule October 2021 for the term ending October 2025. And the proposed policy does form an integral part of the report. Uh, thanks again to everyone involved, and I guess uh, questions are in order. Thanks. Thanks very much. So uh, council members did receive the report as a part of our larger council agenda. And I don't know if there are any particular areas uh, that you want to highlight. Obviously, those recommendations, uh, the details are sort of contained in the proposed policy. And so are there any areas that you wanted uh, to highlight to council or to the public for the record? Well, I think you've had it for a few days. You probably... Uh, Seen it already, thanks. Okay. Um, are there any questions for the delegation? Councillor Bressy. 
Great. Thank, thank you. Thanks for preparing this report. I really appreciate it. I especially really appreciate you guys doing a good comprehensive policy that's got all of it there. I think that really makes it so much easier for potential candidates and also a lot more transparent for the for the public to know what we get paid. So that especially is a piece of work that I really appreciate having it all in one place. Um, just a question I had was on per diems, there's a significant increase to per, to per diems recommended. And also, if I'm reading this right, there'd be a significant change in terms of, if I'm reading this policy right, it would allow per diems to be claimed for in-town events, not just out-of-town events like we can currently uh, claim them for. So first, am I am I interpreting that policy right? And secondly, could somebody just walk me through what your approach to per diems was? Thanks, Councilor Bressy. Um, so I'll, I'll look to the uh, committee members and uh, Lynn, obviously I can't see you. So uh, maybe I'll go to you first if you want to delegate any questions to the rest of your committee. Um, maybe, sir, you want to... maybe, sir, would you like to talk on this one? Well, I believe um, the uh, per diems were based on uh, reviews of other uh, other uh, areas that are, uh, are um, being reviewed. Uh, past uh, per diem. I don't believe there's a significant change uh, from recollection. I have to go back to the uh, council Bessie, but from what I can tell, I think it was just, uh, I would say, cleaned up a bit to uh, make it easier in terms of the uh, the hours and uh, and the dollar amount. So uh, I apologize. I don't have that uh, data from the uh, past reports, but uh, I, I might I might be able to. Uh, we looked at, uh, as you know, I'm on two provincial boards. And we looked at the per diem rates there. Um, and while what we're recommending is under the current provincial rate, um, it still um, it was badly behind uh, what other organizations are, are uh, receiving in the province. Great. Thank you. And then, if I may. Yeah, and kind of, so what I'm reading in this, is, what I'm reading in the policy proposed is a per diem shall be paid to the mayor and councillors to attend an approved event on behalf of the city at the individual's discretion. And then when I go to um, events, I don't see any reference to them having to be out of town when I go to the definition. So is the intent of the committee that councillors would be allowed to claim a per diem for any event they go to or are current practice is we only get to claim per diems if we're doing something outside the city. So what's the, can you just share with me what the committee's intent is with that? Would like to take that from the committee. I doubt if there's any real change. We just, there's a consensus that uh, it'd be uh, bumped up somewhat from the current practice. Thank you. Any other questions for the delegation uh, or any other comments? Mr. Sherbeck. Thanks. Uh, I believe what we were referring to was the, the for per diems was the mandatory events. Um, in that case, those are the ones that are out of town. I don't think we were intending it to be for in-town events. For, for all in-town events. I think we intended for things like uh, uh, meeting the north, yeah. which is a rather yeah. onerous commitment. But other than that, it was just for out of town. Yeah, it does, it does say approved event. Yeah. Councilor Pete. Uh, thank you, Mayor Given, and thank you to the remuneration uh, committee for putting together these recommendations. I think they're very thoughtful and uh, some of them are very intriguing. And I wanted to ask a question about one of the ones that has intrigued me. Um, in regards to the transition subsidy, it's kind of a, a new line. Uh, it's gonna introduce uh, something that I think that uh, the province tried to get out of their own system. Um, I just wanna see the rationale behind uh, point number two in the transition subsidy uh, under, the first point, it says mayor council is eligible for the transition subsidy if they have served a minimum of two years or been defeated. And then, or the second part of that, or is they choose not to run in the next municipal election. Uh, can you just uh, explain to me sort of the reasoning behind that option for a councillor's choice to not run? 
Well, the end result's the same. Pardon? The end result would be the same. Okay. I, I think, Chris, where, what maybe to answer your question, um, the committee felt that it might be one of those things, it's a very small amount. I mean, when you're looking at your average turnover, it's a small amount uh, of dollars that would have to be budgeted, but it might be another carrot that encourages other people to run. Uh, you know, someone uh, with a job that decides to do this, um, it needs some more reassurance that uh, if they don't like it or they don't fit or it doesn't fit for them, um, there is some some minor relief at the end of it, but it was definitely a carrot to encourage other people to step forward. Okay, yeah, no, thanks for that. I kind of, that was uh, sort of my thoughts on it. My other thought on it was it might be a carrot to get people to step down as well and to maybe not prolong uh, the, the <laughs> hey, inevitable. Hey, oh, no, 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 this is for you, Helen. Like if I could have given you a year's like of transition subsidy, I would have given it to you. Um, no, I, I think it's really thoughtful. I just wanted to hear sort of the reasoning behind that. And, and I like that, that, you know, a carrot for somebody who maybe be willing to commit eight years of their life to the city and also a carrot to sit to, for people who say, well, you know what? I don't know if there's much more I can accomplish here and uh, maybe I'll step down and seek out other professional avenues. So yeah, no, thanks. I think they were very thoughtful. They were definitely, they made my eyebrows raise a bit, uh, but uh, uh, nevertheless, I thought they were very good. Thank you. I, I do have a question kind of building on Councillor Bressy's question around per diems and, and uh, just wanna make sure that I understand the intent of the, the recommendation. So if I look at the general provisions section, it suggests that the annual salary and benefits are paid for ma to mayors and councillors for their attendance and performance of regular duties associated with the following responsibilities. And then number two is boards, commissions, and committees as appointed. And so that would be all those external things that, that we the council members may represent the council on. And so if I'm if I was interpreting that, it would say that your salary as a counselor or mayor, your base salary is for all of the, all of the, is all inclusive. Um, and you shouldn't be claiming a per diem to attend a committee that meets in Peace River, even though you were appointed to that committee. If I, if I was interpreting this, that's how I would read it. Is that what the, is that what the, uh, that's what the committee is intending? No, I believe it was uh, those ones that are out of town that still stays, that's, that's within other parts of the policy. So a meeting in Peace River for a committee meeting, you would still be able to, but a meeting across at the library, for example, wouldn't be. Okay, thanks for that. So maybe there's a, um, so the intention was the salary should cover boards, commissions and committees within the local region where a per diem would be acceptable for a board commissioner committee that was meeting outside the local region. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Paul. Uh, thanks, Mary Gibbon. Um, I just a question around the vehicle out, um, the way it's written on here, it's about uh, $200 a month. So I'm curious now if, uh, if a councillor chose or the mayor chose to drive to Edmonton for AUMA, would they would there still be a mileage charge allocated for that, or if we have to drive to Edmonton or Calgary, now is it expected to be that that's part of the two hundred dollars? Anybody? That's extra, I believe. That's extra. That's yeah. Those are two different things. Yeah. Okay. The two hundred dollars was intended for the miles you put on driving around town to various things. No, I, and I appreciate this one because I think most of us are very guilty of never putting in for those. So we're, you know, I think that's a, that's a great one for people that are looking at that running. Um, the other question I had was just around the cell phone uh, at forty dollars a month. And just if you can kind of give me an idea of where that number was plucked from. Um, just talking to most industry and with our businesses, even here, where the city's paid for per diems on cell phones, I just thought that number seemed low. But I'm just curious to see if you can tell me how that number was was figured out at forty a month. That's what other city employees get. Yeah. 
So the recommendation was simply to bring council in line with what the current city policy is for employees. Is that, is that right? Correct. Correct. Okay. Um, any other questions for the, for the committee? Uh, Councillor Blackburn. Thank you, Mayor Gavin. Um, it sounds to me like there are a few things that um, seem to be open to interpretation or are easily misunderstood in the details of the of the new policy. And so I'm wondering, uh, once we go to passing that, um, whether or not uh, there should be some in, am amendments made and whether or not we ought to have the uh, um, the committee involved to ensure that uh, that we uh, understand what their intentions were. Yeah, th thanks for that. I, I believe it was the committee's intention that certainly uh, what's really important in this vote is council's uh, input. And so uh, I think it was always our intent that council could clarify uh, you know, their intent uh, in terms of a policy amendment uh, and leaving them some, some rooms. I wonder, um, so I wonder uh, if the committee has an opinion on how you would define the local region. I know over the years we've tried to do that. I think we might have had, uh, you know, a couple different um, ways of doing it. But if the local region uh, is referenced in there, it says that if you're within the local region, that's what your salary is for. If you're outside the local region, that's what a per diem is for. So that's when you may claim a per diem. How, does the committee have an opinion about what we would define as the local region? It's a bit of a challenging issue and I'm curious if you have any advice for us. I don't think we actually discussed it. Was it 30 kilometer radius? Could have been. That'll get you to Wembley. Yeah, Wembley, Sexsmith, uh, the county. Councillor Bressy, I just point out that a 50 kilometer radius is mentioned in the air travel and transportation okay. costs section. Yeah. So 50 kilometers. Sorry. Okay. Any other questions for the delegation? It doesn't look like we have any. Um, so I do wonder, Council, um, I know we have the delegation portion of our agenda. Just thinking ahead to that um, and before we get to making motions, I wonder if we could maybe think about uh, whether this needs to go through committee for some of these touch-ups um, that, are, that aren't really around the, the content, maybe just around providing further clarity, like that definition of local region adding that into, you know, into the definition section and maybe a few other things. Um, that might be something we'd want to think about. Um, I don't know if the committee has any closing comments that they'd like to make, um, but certainly I'd like to thank you for your work that you do and uh, allowing us to stay somewhat removed out of thinking about politician salaries um, and uh, having that ability to um, make recommendations that will take effect after the next election. We appreciate the work that you do. I don't know if you have any closing comments uh, as chair, Mr. Cole. I have nothing to add. Maybe the other members would like a few words. Well, we, we, a fun we, assignment. We, 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 go ahead, Greg. I was just saying it was a fun assignment. Good doing it. Good, a great team. And it was a great team and we would be remiss not to thank Arlene. She was a fantastic resource uh, for the committee and uh, uh, it was all in all a, a real enjoyable experience. Great, thanks very much. Um, well, if there wasn't anything further, then uh, thank you all for your work and um, much appreciated. You heard the spiel that I gave the last uh, presenters. Uh, you're more than welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting if you want. We just ask that you uh, turn your microphones on to mute and uh, turn your video off as you exit the council table. But thanks very much for your work. Much appreciated. Thank you. You're welcome. Excuse me. I think that handles all of the delegations that let us know ahead of time that they wish to present. 
I think we have a number of other delegations uh, that may be here for other topics. Um, and first, um, we have our additional item with respect to supportive housing. And so I think uh, Mr. James Ham is here. Uh, Mr. Ham, if you are uh, online, I invite you to the council table. Um, uh, we are, uh, council will be reviewing a report uh, just a little bit later on in the agenda, but I would invite you to uh, introduce the topic and uh, share uh, anything you want to share with council with respect to it. Okay, awesome, thank you very much. Uh, so this proposed uh, project is uh, the building beside City Hall. You know, it's, uh, it would be a 44 unit residential building for supportive housing. And, you know, it's located right in downtown. It's close to uh, shopping, grocery stores, the library, and, uh, and there are some schools nearby. And so the residents in the building would have a moderate acuity and, and have some physical, mental, and behavioral health needs. And so there would be 24 hour staff on the main floor that would help take care of those residents and would help take care of you know, the grounds around the building too and make sure that uh, uh, everything around the building is you know, done well. Um, and the project would be a partnership between you know, myself and my company Groundbreaking Construction and the City of Grand Prairie in order to uh, you know, help these people who need this affordable housing. And I am really excited about this project because I do think it will be you know, something great for downtown Grand Prairie. Uh, that Fletcher building beside City Hall has been vacant for many, many years. And uh, I, know, I think revitalizing it, giving it a use will not will help the area and help uh, Grand Prairie as well with you know providing jobs and construction. All of our trades are all local, and I think it would be a great help for Grand Prairie and help our local economy, especially with everything that's going on nowadays. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Ham. Um, any other any questions for the delegation? Yeah, Councillor Bressy. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Uh, thanks for the proposal. Thanks for presenting to us. I'll, I'll have a few questions for our administration later in the meeting when we discuss this, but for Mr. Ham, um, just a question about the rendering that I see in our package. Is the intent hmm. with this project to do some work in the facade of the building too, or? Yes, yeah, so that rendering is, it was for an older uh, concept we were gonna do. We were gonna originally turn it into a business tower and, and decided on not doing it as uh, there wasn't enough demand in Grand Prairie for a project like that. And so the finishings that I would like to see on the building is to keep uh, the red brick on the project and to uh, finish it like the affordable housing project on Resources Road. Uh, the name of it's uh, escaping me right now, but it's just down from the Church of Christ there. And you know, that building's been there for 10 years. It still looks absolutely fantastic. And uh, the siding was more or less maintenance free and yeah, I'd like to do something like that. Great. And then I'm also just kind of curious on the rendering. It says Archie Towers. Is that the intended name of this? And where's Archie come from, if so? Uh, so Archie comes from uh, a company I have with my brother-in-law and our spouses, where it's called Archetype Building and Planning. And so we have a couple commercial and industrial shops around town. That, that's our holding company for those projects. But uh, this project would be my own uh, building company, groundbreaking construction, and uh, it would just be myself that would uh, be in charge of it that way. So yeah, we're going to call it the Arca Tower, but uh, not anymore. <laughs> okay, great. Well, thank you. Um, James, I wonder if you could highlight, um, uh, so there's a, you know, a request to the city. Uh, we'll get more details in the report, but do you want to highlight um, what it is that you're contributing to the overall project in terms of yeah, you know, monetary value of the building or anything else? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, as we spoke about before, uh, the rent that we would be taking from the residents in the, in the tower would be very, very low. So I guess the return on investment compared to one of our commercial projects or industrial projects is, is very, very small. Um, and I feel like that would be the biggest thing that groundbreaking my company would be giving to it, but also uh, just spearheading the, spearheading the project and having local trades like Everyone we use is from Grand Prairie. We've never used anybody from outside. And you know, a larger building uh, contractor might you know, be taken from Edmonton, Calgary, or other places. But I feel like my company would have the greatest impact on local business and our local economy. So you, you mentioned return on investment. And I think it's, you know, the, the public might have questions about that. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, we really are sort of at a stage where uh, you know, we'd have to have open discussion about that as much as possible. So. Um, is this a lucrative area to get into? I imagine that it's not. 
but can you give council a sense of what your expected rate of return is um, so that we can have a sense of, of whether this is a, a really large money-making venture or not? Absolutely. So in our commercial shops and our commercial centers that we have in town, uh, this would probably, the return on these would probably be about a third of what we would have everywhere else. So in order for us to make money with it, or if I was really interested in making money with it, I'd sell the project and just do something else. But uh, as I said before, I have a sister who was on H and it was in these sorts of projects. And I think this is something awesome that the government of Grand Prairie is doing for people in need because lots of people really do need it. And I think it's a fantastic thing to do. Thank you. Are there any other uh, questions for the delegation? Council, any other questions for the delegation? Doesn't look like we do have, oh, Councillor O'Toole, go ahead. Yeah, just, just for the public, uh, what's the timeline on construction and moving in? Once you, once this gets approved and you got contractors in working. So my hope would be to have um, our engineers done the completed business design with all the mechanical and things that would need done in a month and a half. And then after that, I see a six to eight month window for construction uh, that we would be completed by ready to move in. I'm hoping it will be less than that, but, uh, but I think eight months would be conservative. So you're looking at a spring, op uh, spring opening then? Yes. Now, I think that's one of the great benefits of this project is the structure is up and we can, and it's totally got it on the inside so we can get at it right away. We'll be employing a local trade right away and it'll have an immediate benefit to Grand Prairie in the area. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Council O'Toole. Um, last opportunity, Council, if there are any other questions. Then seeing none, uh, thanks for being here, James. Uh, appreciate your presentation. Uh, we will be dealing with this just shortly on our agenda, and so uh, you'll you'll see the council discussion on that. And that that time is when uh, Mr. Manuel would introduce the report and the details for us. Um, but thanks for making yourself available during this delegation portion of the agenda. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, and uh, as you saw, we'll ask you to. There you go. People are, people have got it already. I've said it a couple times, and so I'm hoping that everybody else that's on the line has that as well. Um, we do have this opportunity for any other delegations. Now, my understanding was that there may have been another delegation related to this topic uh, specifically. Um, I don't know if there is anybody related to this topic uh, who wished to make a presentation this afternoon. Um, and if there's not, then uh, we'll move on. I understand there may be a couple of presentations related to Item 7.2, the development permit question. I do see Mr. Cameron's name. And so I would imagine, Brad, that you wanted to make a presentation related to that development permit. Uh, so I would invite you to join us at the council table by turning on your microphone and your camera. And this would be the opportunity for you to make a, a uh, presentation as a part of that development permit application. Hi, Brad. Hi, hi, Bill. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, hello, councillors and, and everyone else on the call. Um, yeah, basically, as the development authority um, for the uh, DC district that I'm in, uh, we need to come to you uh, anytime there's a significant change. So uh, basically, um, one of our commercial tenants uh, left uh, unexpectedly in September. And uh, we've had that uh, area um, sort of uh, available. And uh, we had a, a psychology and counseling uh, business approach us and uh, very similar to a lot of the other uh, businesses that we have uh, in the building. So um, basically we're just coming uh, for that change of use approval. Um, I, don't, I don't think there should be any uh, significant change uh, to the neighborhood or uh, any of our uh, surrounding neighbors and, and residents. Uh, I think it's a very, uh, a great use. It's, we have other counselors in the building and it just works great. So uh, I'm excited about the possibility. Okay. Thanks very much, Mr. Cameron. Any questions for the delegation? 
I don't see any questions from Council, Brad. So uh, thanks very much for being here uh, this afternoon. Obviously, you know where the uh, the development permit is on the Council agenda. Um, so we'll deal with it in uh, relatively short order here. Okay. Thanks. Thanks again, Brad. Um, so we'll invite you to exit the council table. <laughs> Thank you. Um, was there anybody else that was here hoping to present with respect to uh, this development permit? Uh, PL200205. Yes, I see you, uh, Norma. Go ahead. If you'll just introduce yourself, you've kind of heard the spiel about five minutes and then opportunity for any question. Go ahead, Ms. Barber. Thank you so much, Mary Given. Um, thank you for I, uh, listening to me, I, my name is Norma Barber and I own a 12 suite apartment on the south side of the tower. Um, those of you who have been in Grand Prairie for some time, I own the middle one of the three Prairie apartments that have been there for a very long time. I realize that the, the units that they're proposing are, it looks like they're handicap stalls but I was hoping to see, appeal to city council to allow nothing that would allow more evening parking. If any of you have been around that building uh, after eight o'clock at night, both sides of 102nd Street, 104th Avenue, 105th Avenue are just jammed. And yet the surprising part is, is that the parking lot, which appears to go with the this building, this residential building is about Two thirds empty. So I was wondering if there's, I realize that, you know, that you're just building two more apartments, but maybe since it's opening and you're talking about the development of this building, if city council could do something that would make it so that the people in the apartment could park in the parking lot and get off of the street. And I would appeal to them to have no more units that need evening parking because it's already way, way too congested. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks, Ms. Barber. Any questions for the delegation? Uh, Ms. Barber, can you um, the, can you sort of clarify for me what you mean by uh, evening parking? I would say if you go around that area on 102nd Street, just across from the Catholic Church, and then go 104th Avenue, 105th Avenue. Typically, over the last you know number of years, up until Care and Apartments was built, um, you know there's reasonable amount of parking on the street. Um, since they were built, if you go in that area after about eight o'clock at night, this is when you'll see both sides of the avenue and and the street for about two blocks or at least a at least a block. So I'm not exaggerating. Is just jammed. So anybody that it was going to visit someone in the apartment or if one of the apartments say has because those apartments typically have one parking stall that was required at the time it was built um so they might be some on street parking but since that apartment was built and it doesn't seem to have enough parking for the apartment and then if i was a betting person i would su suspect that the karen charges them for parking and people say oh i'm going to just park on the street so the parking that's for the building is Two thirds empty at nighttime, and the and the the streets are full, and that doesn't seem like a good way to manage a building. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other questions for the delegation? It doesn't look like uh, there are any other questions from council. So, uh, Ms. Barber, thanks very much for being thank here and making the presentation. Um, thank you. Uh, were there anybody? Was there anybody else uh, who was attending the council meeting? Uh, with the hope of making a presentation. Oh, and I'll just ask uh, Ms. Barber if you can um, I will. I just want to council table. The speaking about this. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah you're more than welcome to stick around if you can just, uh, yeah, there you go. Um, uh, was there anybody else that wanted to make a presentation um, on this development permit or any other matter? Were there any other delegations uh, that we're hoping to present uh, during this portion of our open delegation section? I will just ask uh, administration, uh, I'll check with the city clerk to see if there was anybody else uh, who let us know in advance if they wish to uh, make a delegation presentation or if we've had anybody attend at city hall to the lobby. Thank you, Mayor Given. Um, up to this time, there are no other delegations that have reached out to present at the three o'clock portion of this meeting. Okay, 
thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Arlene. Um, that being the case, then we'll close the delegation portion of our agenda council. We do have another scheduled delegation for an, uh, an evening session of council. Um, so we will have an, an evening uh, delegation, but we'll close this portion of our agenda um, and move on. We have no items of unfinished business. And so that does take us into the reports section of our council meeting. Uh, we'll start first with our new item 7.1, which is a supportive housing proposal. Um, that was the item that we heard from Mr. Ham about, and I would invite uh, Director Manuel to join us and uh, present the report that I think should have been emailed out to Council. Go ahead, there, Director Manuel. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, as was mentioned, we had a welcome report this afternoon uh, due to some uh, time sensitivities around uh, interest in the subject property um, from uh, other interested parties. So what we have is uh, you heard from Mr. Ham, who represents uh, groundbreaking construction. And uh, Mr. Ham essentially reached out and uh, connected with administration uh, to gauge what our interest and in community need is in uh, a supportive housing project. Um, being developed on his uh, his subject property, which used to be the former uh, Grand Prairie Care Center. So it is a building that administration had identified as uh, a potential desirable location for such a project, uh, given its uh, proximity to amenities, its uh, existing abandoned status, and the, the opportunity to see it redeveloped into uh, a, a, I guess, uh, updated development uh, that would improve the, the facade and just the fit within the overall uh, neighborhood. So the ask we have for council here today is in order to advance uh, what really is a, a multi-million dollar private investment in social housing, which is something that uh, frankly, we don't see it come along very often for these opportunities. In order to advance the project where it would essentially be viable to proceed, the applicant has uh, asked for um, city support to where it's being requested that up to $291,000 be allocated by council in way of an economic stimulus grant. So um, the applicant, uh, Mr. Ham, identified that uh, in order to accomplish the multi-million dollar renovation, uh, significant construction is gonna occur in the short term. And given the um, impacts of COVID on the economy and, uh, and some other challenges that our area is facing, uh, it is, in, in my opinion, a prudent consideration for council as this uh, really is pretty much a shovel ready project that could get people to work in, uh, in short order while at the same time, addressing community need around homelessness and housing. Um, even uh, it seems to be consistent with the letter we received from the Chamber of Commerce uh, not too long ago, I believe it was approximately a month ago that identified stimulus activities that could occur. And within them was permanent supportive housing, affordable housing. Um, there was certainly uh, facade improvement. Uh, so we seem to check a lot of boxes off there. So I think it is a, a prudent ask. And outside of the startup funds that the $291,000 would uh, assist in making that project go is a need to, in order to keep the rents low, so a person that's living on AISH or on um, just uh, peer government subsidy for income, uh, in order to keep their rents as low as they can be to meet their um, um, financial needs, the it's likely that an annual operating grant of approximately around $100,000 or up to $100,000 will be necessary to offset the cost of providing a nonprofit management body to, um, to administer the um, tenancy agreements and provide the preventative maintenance and stuff within the building. So really uh, at this point, administration sees this as a partnership uh, where groundbreaking construction would take on the financing, construction, and ownership of this building. The city of Grand Prairie would provide um, oversight as far as 
the administration of provincial dollars to uh, determine which clients would go in there. The ongoing support teams would be uh, procured, uh, again, using pass-through provincial dollars. So what's envisioned is uh, the individuals with the moderate level of acuity that uh, James mentioned, they will require some on-site supports to ensure their success in, in that environment. And uh, we believe that we have the financial commitment from the province to fund the supportive teams to assist the residents. And additionally, the rents will be kept at a level to which um, the, the individuals living there will in fact be paying rent. It's uh, the units aren't given to them. That's it. They'll be paying rent from their allocation of monthly funds. And um, I guess really administration sees this as a, as a win to advance a, a project using a almost a P3 level um, structure that we just frankly don't see in this, this realm very often. And I think it's timely. Okay, hey, thanks very much, Mr. Manuel. Any questions for administration? Yeah, go ahead, Councillor Brethy. Great, thank you. Um, just, to, I've, I've always got a concern with us doing things that are a bit of a walk on in the public not having a chance to see. So just a question about process. My understanding is that this would have to come to council again for a uh, development permit. And therefore there, this is council saying, hey, we're gonna continue this conversation. It's not us giving final approval to this going ahead. Is that a correct understanding of the process? Uh, thank you, right. Councillor. Um, that would be correct. It, as like any other um, development, it will be subject to, uh, in this case, it will require rezoning of the, uh, the parcel and ultimately development permits, which will all involve um, um, pu public uh, consultation or, or at least public notification and an opportunity to provide um, further information. And uh, uh, I suspect that the applicant will have a, a fairly robust uh, community engagement strategy as the uh, project moves forward. The something that is unique about this again is it's not a a city driven project. It really is uh, the the ownership and the momentum behind it is coming from the private applicant. Um, certainly, the city's been here to provide some guidance and certainly describe the need that exists within the community. Okay, I see Councillor Thiessen. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Given. Um, and just a quick comment. Uh, part of our, our economic recovery strategy and our survey that was uh, given to Council uh, by the Chamber of Commerce, uh, one of the top items that they earmarked was the, I guess, uh, the investment in affordable housing to get trades and other people going. I guess my question is, uh, because we're in the public arena, and I know, I just kind of want the public to know, um, are there any, with this proposed development, are there any exterior... Uh, improvements that will be made now, not just to the building, but in and around, um, I guess, the Aberdeen Centre and that alleyway and in that back area, uh, the backyard area of it. Uh, is there anything like that? Uh, and the reason I ask is, uh, is because I know that there are some safety concerns with uh, traffic moving back and forth, especially with a vulnerable population potentially moving into that building. Um, will there, there be external upgrades to ensure that safety is, is well, safer? There we go. Yeah, no, uh, another great question. So uh, aside from the facade improvements to the structure itself, certainly there'll be a fencing, landscaping, parking component to the development, uh, which will all have to meet uh, a, a new standard. Additionally, though, uh, this is an area that the city has taken some investment into where um, uh, recently there was capital adjustments made in, uh, about a month or two ago, which actually entails greater fencing in that area, um, particularly to address some of the traffic concerns, pedestrian traffic concerns, and, uh, and I guess defining proper spaces. And aside from that, uh, we are also launching our um, crime mitigation grants, which we've received a number of in that area. And we expect to have decisions on those later this month that we'll see, again, greater capital investment, both from the private sector and from the city in the way of matching dollars to, uh, to make improvements. And then the other initiative is 
this will really, this particular geographical area will be a strong focus of our mobile outreach teams, which are scheduled to launch in the next month here as well. So there's a lot of work underway to, to really address a number of those, those points that uh, you've made there, Councillor. Thank you very much, uh, Director Manuel. Okay. Any other questions for administration? If there aren't, then uh, this is a report and we'd be looking for any motions arising. Yeah, Councillor Friesen. Thank you. So I will, uh, <clears throat> sorry, make a motion that council subject, subject to negotiation completion of the necessary legal contract allocate the following funds to the proposed community supportive housing project located at 10039 98th Street, Grand Prairie. First being economic stimulus grant of 291,000 and second being an annual operating grant to support a nonprofit management body in the amount of $100,000. And uh, just to speak briefly to this, um, it is rare that we get a private investor who is willing to, uh, there, there are other things that this, this uh, individual can do or this company can do with this building that um, would make more money for them. And, uh, and that's usually the case. That's why we don't get private investors coming to us with, uh, with offers like this. So um, when I, when I look at that and um, consider the amount that we have to put toward this and that other, um, you know, other grants and other streams of funding would have to put toward getting something like this online, this is um, a, a small investment by the city to do something that is a much needed um, project in Grand Prairie. So I, I really do think that this is a, a wise investment of um, both economic stimulus because it's shovel ready and we can get $291,000 um, worth of work going almost immediately. Uh, and the, to speak to the annual operating grant, um, the, this is an estimate. It, my understanding is that this is an estimate and um, that is money also that I know will, will be, um, it, it will be leveraged to uh, really get the best work that we can out of a nonprofit that will help us understand how to better manage future projects. This is something that's not going away. This is a priority for this council. And, um, you know, we, we're getting some work done on it, but next term is going to happen. And I think that uh, this will continue to be a priority for the next council as well. Uh, it's certainly been identified uh, very strongly and wholeheartedly by, I, I think, um, I, I haven't heard a, a colleague of mine speak against um, the need for affordable and supportive housing and, and different kinds of community housing in Grand Prairie. This is a brilliant way to do it. So um, I'd like to get this going. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, Councillor Friesen. Any other discussion or debate on the motion? Councillor Thiessen. No, thank you, Mayor Given. I'll just throw my two cents here. Uh, fully in support of the, of the motion. This is sort of a passion of mine. Uh, it's a, I think it's becoming a passion of this council, in fact, uh, to take care of the greater needs of our community, even and especially those who are a bit uh, misfortuned at this at this time. Uh, it's it's very rare, as Councillor Friesen said, to to have these private public partnerships in regards to housing, at least in our community. I mean, we do have another one that's on the line waiting for another decision to be made. Um, but you know what, hopefully this is a start of a domino. It starts with one and then moves on to another. Uh, we all carry the load for the greater purpose and ends of our community. So uh, taking care of those basic needs, providing that shelter and those supports. Uh, I just wanna thank uh, our administration for uh, being open to these possibilities as well as um, our our delegation or our, I guess our, our private investor, uh, Mr. Ham and his group, uh, for really, you know, trying to find something that works, not just for themselves, but also for the community to do some good. So for all those reasons, I, 
I'm full support of this and I hope council is supported as well. Thank you. Okay, thanks Councilor Thiessen. Councilor O'Toole. Yes, I'm in full support of this. Uh, the numbers look like they're pretty high, but when you uh, look at the amount of resources that we put in to the city with policing, hospital staff, ambulances, and uh, that kind of stuff, that should diminish uh, some degree. And uh, with a person living in their own home under their roof, uh, I think that the mental health quality will go up rather than living on the streets and uh, trying to trying to uh, maintain a lifestyle that's not necessarily great. This will actually reverse that and give them pride in being in a home that is uh, looked after and the quality staff that will be there. So thank you. Okay, thanks Councillor O'Toole. Any other discussion or debate? I don't see any. Um, then I will call for the vote on Councillor Friesen's motion. All those in favor? Thank you, that looks unanimous. Thank you. Uh, thanks Director Manuel for presenting that report. Um, we'll move next to item 7.2, which is development permit PL200205, a change of use at 10405 102nd Street. Um, I would look for an introduction to this uh, from Ms. Brock. Kimberly. Thank you, Mayor Gibbon. I'm going to share my screen as I have a presentation. Administration has received a development permit application to change the uses on the ground floor of a mixed use apartment building, also known as the Karen. The subject property is located at 10405 102 Street, is located in a DC, so the Direct Control 14 uh, land use district, where nearby land uses include a religious assembly, private school, mixed use density apartment developments, um, office buildings, downtown businesses, and Muscacipi Park. The ground floor is currently occupied by an office, a community outreach facility, and a health facility for uh, therapy offices as well. The proposed changes would replace the approved retail store that was to be used as a pharmacy and further develop vacant space. The applicant is seeking to change the use of, uh, sorry, change the use to include three additional health facilities, which will include counseling services and uh, holistic therapy and two residential dwelling units. The proposed uses are similar in character to the existing uses in the building and are similarly compatible with the surrounding land use um, context. Parking for this development is addressed through a combination of on-site and remote uh, parking uh, with a total of 67 parking stalls. No additional parking would be required for the proposed change of use. The subject property is located within the land use bylaw by overlay for the South Avondale Area Redevelopment Plan and further located within the 102nd Street Corridor in Map 2 of that plan. The proposed change of use within the subject property complies with the policies and objectives of the South Avondale Area Redevelopment Plan. And as previously indicated, the subject site is located in the DC 14 District. All existing and proposed uses are listed uh, in the DC 14 District. This district designates council as the development authority, which may make determinations on any of the development standards, for example, parking, landscaping, et cetera, or other matters as it deems relevant. Determinations regarding the site standards and other considerations were made during previous development approvals for the subject property, including parking, fencing, and landscaping. Administration considers the application to be complete and conforming to the land use bylaw and relevant statutory plans. In accordance with administration's recommendation and direction from the Infrastructure and Economic Development Committee uh, at the June 23rd, 2020 meeting, notices were um, sent to the adjacent neighbors of the proposed uh, change of use. A total of eight uh, neighbors were notified. Administration did receive one phone call regarding parking in response to the circulation. However, uh, nothing was submitted uh, in, in writing. The proposed development application is to change the use on the ground floor of a mixed use apartment building. The proposed uses include minor health facilities and residential dwellings. 
These uses are similar to the existing uses in the building. There are no anticipated new impacts related to the proposed change of use. Further, the proposed change of use conforms to the South Avondale Re Redevelopment Plan and the Land Use Bylaw. Therefore, administration recommends that Council approves the proposed change of use subject to the conditions uh, stated in the Development Permit PL 200205. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Ms. Brock. Any questions for administration? Uh, Councillor Minhas? So I have a question for you because the issue came up with the parking lot. Will this increase the parking with the doing this one or it'll be the same more parking at the night time, especially because that's the issue came out for you on the delegation? Ms. Brock? Thank you, Mayor Gibbon. Uh, there will be no changes made to the existing parking areas. The, when the development permits were proposed and approved by council in the past, the parking considerations were taken into and approved at that time. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Councilor Minhas. Councilor Bressy. Great, thank you. Great, thank you. I'm just, I I'm just trying to figure out um, how many more. Uh, well, well, here, here's what I guess I, my question is: How many? Do you know how many units are in the building already? I'm trying to figure out how, like, kind of a, a percentage base, how many units we're adding to it. So, how many units are already are already approved in this building? Ms. Brock. Thank you, Mayor Given. Um, I don't have that number right at hand, but Mr. Cameron is on. If we could ask him to jump in, he could tell us right away. Uh, sure. Just on that point, Mr. Cameron, uh, can you confirm the number of units that uh, residential units that exist in the building right now? Uh, hi, Mayor Given Council. Uh, there's 83 residential units. Thanks for that, Brad. Okay. Any other questions for administration? Councillor O'Toole. This was a question while Brad was up, I just, uh, regarding parking, there's obviously a number of people in there that do not have vehicles. They rely on bus service. I was wondering how many he would estimate actually uh, suites or units that uh, there is no resident that's used asking for parking. Mr. Cameron. Uh, thank you, Mayor Given and uh, Councillor O'Toole. Uh, I, I am unsure of that. I would suggest that um, there's probably about 40 units that have vehicles, um, but I, I, don't, uh, I don't have that information. It's not, uh, it's not a question I normally get. Well, fair enough. That's uh, it's about half your units that have parking, and uh, that's a guess, and I understand that. But thank you very much for your answer. Thanks, Councillor Tool. Councillor Friesen. Thank you, Mayor Given. Um, thanks, Mr. Cameron. Uh, I I want to actually get just a little more specific on the parking. I understand that these are to be um, accessible units that are developed. And so my question is specifically regarding the accessible or the, the handicap stalls um, that are in the back of your building or um, in the parking area. What's utilization like on those? And um, would two additional corresponding um, stalls be able to be added if needed? Mr. Cameron. Uh, thank you, Mayor Given, Councillor Friesen. Um, we, we don't have any room to add additional stalls. That was all uh, addressed um, the last time we went through this process. Um, I guess there would be uh, the possibility of uh, taking some of those stalls and um, changing them uh, to be accessible if, if that was the case. Um, Interestingly, uh, we have uh, about a dozen accessible units upstairs and uh, very few uh, people that uh, require accessible units live in those. Uh, so we've, we've actually, even though we have a number of accessible units, we've only had a handful of people um, that 
actually are in wheelchairs or have mobility challenges. That's fine, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Cameron. Uh, I think I saw Councillor Thiessen. Yeah, thank you very much, Mayor Given. I um, uh, appreciate the delegation coming in and, and speaking to the parking. Um, I'm not totally opposed to it because as uh, Mr. Cameron has said, uh, we, have, uh, we have discussed this pretty ad nauseum between two councils and uh, that's, that's okay. Just a question to Mr. Cameron in regards to parking. Um, do the tenants of uh, your apartment building in the Cairn, do they have to pay extra for a parking stall? Uh, part of what our delegation had asked or had said was that there's a lot of parking around the building, but most of the time the parking lot is empty. Um, do you charge and is there the potential that maybe you don't have to charge to uh, discourage, I guess, the parking on the street? Mr. Cameron? Uh, thank you, Mayor Given. Uh, Councillor Thiessen, um, yes, we do charge for our parking uh, similar to other apartments in town. Uh, I think that's actually a, a pretty standard uh, sort of thing. Um, the reason we charge is because not all of our residents require uh, parking. So in an effort to have everybody's rent as low as possible, um, only the people who need parking actually pay help pay for the parking so i guess it would be possible but i think it would be unfair to some of our um most vulnerable people uh to be charging them for parking or for a portion of the parking um lot so um so yes there there is a, a cost and as you probably know uh, parking lots are quite expensive to develop and to maintain so um i i think that that's why so. Yeah, def definitely not asking you to, to do any of those upgrades. Uh, just a follow up question. Um, is, is your parking fully subscribed with the residents? Uh, no, it's not. We actually have, uh, as the uh, other, as Norma had indicated, we actually have uh, quite a few uh, empty parking stalls, uh, which, um, yeah, was part of our discussion the last time. Um, but uh, the basically, we were asked to build as many stalls as possible on the land that was there and that's what we've done. Okay, yep, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Thiessen. Okay, and thanks, Mr. Cameron. Any other questions for administration or the delegation uh, before we close and move on to motions rising? Seeing none, then uh, Ms. Brock, Mr. Cameron, thanks uh, to both of you and I'll look to council for any uh, motions uh, to deal with this development permit. Councillor Thiessen. Thank you very much, Mayor Given. I'll put this on the table. I'll move that Council approve development permit PL200205 subject to the conditions noted in appendix number six, development permit PL200205. Okay, thanks, Councillor Thiessen. Uh, open for discussion and debate. Um, and uh, when we come to voting, uh, we'll have to do the visual vote by council members. So is there any discussion or debate on the motion from Councillor Thiessen? Seeing none, uh, then I will call for the vote. Uh, all those in favor? That appears to be unanimous. Thanks very much, Council. Um, and we will move on then. Uh, that handles all the business on 7.2 and we'll move on to the item that was moved uh, to 7.1. This is Councilor Bressy's notice of motion with respect to mental health and policing. Uh, Councilor Bressy, uh, in accordance with our uh, procedure bylaw, provided a notice of motion at the last council meeting. And so I would turn it over to Councilor Bressy to uh, introduce his motion. Great. Thank you, Mary Given. I appreciate it. Um, so I've got five motions here, and well, it's five clauses motion. And the first three are kind of asking council to acknowledge that some challenges exist. And then the fourth and fifth ones are asking council to take some specific actions. So I Think if it works for the chair, maybe what I'll do is instead of making people vote on all five of them at once, maybe I'll make the first three motions. And if those pass, then I'll go do, go talk about the potential solutions. Awesome. So then I would move that council affirm that mental health challenges jeopardize the safety of some residents and decrease the viability of our community. Acknowledge that in Grand Prairie and across Alberta, police are often called to be the sole responders in situations where mental health professionals or other resources should be in place to support or, repl or replace police responses and assert that more proactive and preventative approaches to mental health addictions and housing would improve our community while decreasing demands on costly police and emergency health care resources. 
I'll stop there for now. And again, this is just asking council to endorse that there's some challenges here without yet proposing any specific actions to solve those. And to speak to this a little bit, I know that we all agree that mental health is a big concern in our community. It's something that endangers the safety of some residents. It's something that lowers the perceived safety of many more residents. And it's something that as it makes us a less desirable place to live and to work and to run a business and to visit, I think it does jeopardize the viability of our, of our community. And I know the council recognizes that too, because it's one of the top focus areas we've given administration. And in this very meeting, we've allocated significant resources to helping address it. Where the police come in is no news to you folks that that's been a very topical conversation lately around what's the role of police in responding to mental health. And let me say about recent conversations that I don't think they've really shifted my thinking significantly on this. I think that for a long time, I've thought that we're overusing police resources to make up for deficits of other resources in the community. Uh, you'll remember that Myself and Director Manuel attended a number of consultations with the province throughout 2019 talking about the Police Act. And something that both Director Manuel and myself advocated for, along with many other stakeholders, including police forces and police associations, was the idea that there's been a very large creep in the scope of police forces over the last few decades. And that that's not good for communities. It's not good for the officers involved who are often being asked to respond to situations that they maybe don't have the training for and usually don't have the time in their shift to properly deal with in the way that it should be. It's also something that's very, very, very expensive to taxpayers. And as I talk about this, I wanna be really clear that I'm not saying that there's no role for police in mental health concerns. I think when somebody is in a crisis and they're posing a potential danger to others, certainly some police response is appropriate. And often when they're posing a danger to themselves, some police response is also appropriate to make sure that everybody's immediately safe. But in those situations, I, think, I don't think that there's adequate resources for the police to properly hand off the situation once it's safe to other professionals who can help find some long-term help and some, some supports and some improvement beyond just the immediate situation. I also think that a lot of the times police are asked to go into these dangerous situations because somebody hits a point of crisis because there wasn't, a, there wasn't enough support for them going up to it. And that crisis could have been prevented in the first place if there had been adequate resources. And so I hope the council will, uh, pass, will pass this motion and just endorse along with me the idea that mental health is a real concern in our community and the police are often being overused in mental, mental health calls. And again, this motion, I don't know what your thoughts are on the next two I'm going to make. Again, this motion is just acknowledging there's a problem. I think it's a different discussion saying what do we want to do to address that, address that problem. Okay, thanks, Council Bressi. Uh, open for discussion debate on uh, this collection of the, the first part, uh, the first three points. Councillor uh, Blackburn and then Councillor Clayton. Thank you, Mayor Given. Um, I, I don't object to um, uh, agreeing with the assertions that are being made here. Uh, just one thing that I will point out is that we uh, uh, we see our fire department as first responder to a lot of emergency calls because there are times when they can get there first and and assist in dealing with the emergency before uh, before the other organizations that uh, that might more effectively respond uh, can get there. Uh, I think we have a similar situation here in that um, the police can respond and also that they will be there in case that a situation escalates. So uh, I'm agreeing with Councillor Bressi that there is an important role for police to play, but I'm not sure that uh, we can say that um, making a change will reduce the amount of time and energy that the police would have in responding to these situations. Um, and perhaps in the next motion, there would be some discussion about the effective change that might come from this, but I just want to put it in people's minds that uh, we don't want the police to stop being a part of that response. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Blackburn. Uh, I think I had Councillor Clayton next. 
Councillor Clayton, we're not pick, I'm not picking you up. Uh, it looks like your mute is off, but I didn't hear you. No, still, still no audio there. Uh, by all means, uh, see what you can do to get it set up and we can come back to you. Um, are there any other uh, comments on Councillor Bressy's motion? Um, um, just maybe to buy a little time for Councillor Clayton, but I'll uh, also just say that uh, I think uh, I'm very supportive of the motion. I think that this um, is an acknowledgement of things that this city council in past have, have seen about our community. Um, and uh, there's some evidence in the following motions uh, with, uh, that previous councils and this council have taken steps to support adding additional resources other than uh, police. Um, I think it's also important to recognize that there's a continuum uh, that really starts at prevention and things like our neighborhood safety grants, uh, the development of neighborhood associations and building connections among residents um, helps provide for safety and are all different ways that uh, we can invest in our community and improve safety. Um, and so I'm very happy to support the motions that are here uh, because they really are in alignment with the practice of the city of Grand Prairie. And I think it's um, uh, a right and appropriate thing that this council endorses those in a very explicit nature. Um, and uh, I'm happy to be able to do that. Councillor Clayton, uh, were you able to get your audio going there? No, it doesn't look like it. And so it's not showing on our end that, uh, that you're muted. And so my uh, apologies. Um, yeah, because it doesn't, yeah, it's, okay. Yeah, yeah, apologies, Councilor Clayton. So um, with that hiccup, um, were there any other comments on Councilor Gressy's uh, first motion? Seeing none, uh, then I, oh, sorry, Councilor Gressy, if you wish to close. Uh, I don't wish to close, but I just wonder, uh, my personal view is wouldn't be surprising to you guys as somebody bringing this forward is that this is really important. And I'm wondering if a five minute recess, recess might be appropriate to let Councillor Clayton maybe see if she can call in with phone with her phone to use that kind of audio or I just for for me, I think this is a really important thing in our community. I hate that, that if Councillor Clayton wants to contribute, I don't know if she's in support or against, but I, I hate for her not to be able to contribute. Uh, I see that Councillor Clayton has uh, left the meeting and it doesn't look like uh, she's on screen anymore. Um, by all means, uh, we, you know, um, will make time for council members. Uh, I'm not sure that I, I, I'm not sure that we need to take a, a pause here. I did see her sort of give me a wave off of like, I'm, I'm okay for right now. Yep. Um, I certainly will have a little bit of time between now and when you get to your uh, voting on the second portion of your motions. Um, so I'll just check to see if there's any other comments on this part before we go to voting. Councillor O'Toole. Uh, Councillor Clayton is just coming back on. Yeah, thanks, Councillor O'Toole. I, I see that. Councillor Clayton, uh, how's your audio now? No. Councillor Clayton, I just want to check... Um, can you let us know whether you wish to make a comment uh, that was generally supportive of this or were you opposed? Yeah, so generally supportive, okay. So there wasn't, uh, there wasn't something that we were missing substantive from the conversation, okay. Uh, uh, so with that, uh, then I will call for the vote on this first part of the motion. Um, all those in favor? Thank you, and that motion passes unanimously. And then we'll go to Councillor Bressy um for the second part great uh, and then i'm just going to make the number four right right now and i'll save the number five for after this one but i'd move the council direct the mayor to write to premier kenny and appropriate ministers expressing the local effectiveness of police and crisis teams various supporting houses supportive housing projects and other provincial city partnerships and asking to discuss further partnership opportunities to invest in mental health addictions and housing support and just speak to this um it's I know that often we write letters saying, hey, this is what we think is wrong. And we, I don't know if we as often, as often write letters saying, hey, here's something we really appreciate. And I know that there has been, in some areas, there has been some increased investment by the province, especially throughout COVID. And I'd like to, and I think it is appropriate for us really to highlight that the, there are provincial dollars already at work in our community and that those are, very important they're making big impacts and we hope that they're here to stay while also saying hey we'd love to 
explore explore other opportunities. And for me, this really is talking about partnerships, not just saying, "Hey, province, we want to shell, we want you to shovel more money, but we want to put up some of our money along alongside of you or some of our staff resources alongside you." A great example of that is Pact, where the city funds an RCMP officer and the province funds a nurse. And I think that's something that we're in need of expanding expanding more so. So whether it's that or others, I think it's great to say to the province, we really appreciate our existing partnerships and we'd like to find more ways to work together. Thanks, Councillor Bressey. Uh, open for discussion, Councillor Blackburn. Thank you, Mayor Gibbon. Um, thank you, uh, Councillor Bressy, for, for this motion. And, and I really do believe that it's something that's important for us. I, I don't have a suggestion about this uh, in terms of wording, but I wonder if we should be a little more specific about uh, the need for uh, uh, appropriate funding for PACT so that in fact, um, we can be more effective and reduce the strain on the policing um, uh, activities if we had the right number of PAC teams available to, uh, to respond 24-7, uh, if possible, uh, to the concerns that, uh, uh, that call them out. Okay, thanks, Councillor Blackburn. Councillor Thiessen? Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Given. Uh, I want to also thank Councillor Bressy for bringing this motion forward. Um, but I don't, I don't agree with uh, Councillor Blackburn on this uh, most recent point about uh, asking for increased uh, funding or whatnot. I think that's actually directed in Dylan's uh, fifth point on this notice of motion, and really that's us digging in and doing the hard work and seeing where we can find the most appropriate investments. I think this is right in line with what even the the government. Uh, promised during the elections that they wanted to increase supports to mental health uh, and to addictions and and housing, but uh, mental health was one that they kept tooting over and over and over again. And uh, using this in conjunction with what we know works, which is the PAC team, um, I think if those discussions are going to happen with the province, uh, it's it's not going to be easy sledding to uh, come in with their hand out and say, hey. Uh, we think this is great. You should invest in it more. I think that's a decision that our council can make and a case that we can build over time with the province and maybe see those additional investments or redirection of funds. Um, but uh, if this motion were to get changed on point four right now, asking for increased investment, I could support it. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Councilor Thiessen. Councilor Plot. Uh, thanks, Mayor Given. I really appreciate the intent on this too from Councilor Bresti, but for me, I. I we're already going to have a discussion later today about writing a letter. For me, I'd love to see us be having a conversation about an advocacy strategy that we were hoping to happen when strategic planning was happening. And of course, that hasn't happened. So I don't want to see us just as council write letter after letter after letter until we start having some conversations about a proper advocacy strategy moving forward. So um, I think it's great intent. I don't know enough about it. And I wish we were having a little bit more conversation about uh, if this is the end goal or just the start of a goal for me. So I, I couldn't support writing more letters until we have a conversation with advocacy. I think the one that we're about to hopefully support is important to me, but I think other than that, we just, let's let's have some chats with advocacy as a council before we start writing letter after letter uh, to the province. Okay, thanks, Councillor Plot. Any uh, other discussion or debate? Uh, Councillor Clayton, let's give it a try. Yeah, apologies, Councillor Clayton. So I don't know, I, I see that you have shut down and restarted a couple of times. I don't know if there's another device that you can try. Um, I think uh, Council is willing to ensure that everybody's heard, I mean, literally heard on this. Um, and so um, I don't know, Councillor Clayton, if there's another device that you could try or if uh, taking a break would allow you to do that. I see that you've done it a couple of times. Is there any other discussion or debate uh, while we're waiting? It looks like Councillor Clayton's uh, pause. No, I don't think so, Councillor Clayton. Uh, I will say that I'm uh, supportive of the, this portion of the motion, motion. I think Grand Prairie has a long history of um, making use of great partnerships um, between Alberta Health Services, for example, 
the government of Alberta and uh, municipal resources. That's what PACT really is. Um, the other, I think it is a good idea to demonstrate how effective those types of partnerships have been and the diverse range of partnerships that we have. Um, I am supportive of writing this letter now um, and rather than waiting uh, for a strategy. If we were gonna wait for a strategy, then I would say that we should not write any letters um, and I would apply that same thinking to all topics that council might consider. So if we're saying, um, you know, uh, let's hold off on advocacy until we have an overall advocacy plan, that might be fair. I would apply that same thinking uh, to any other items that we wanted to discuss. Um, I think it's reasonable for us to highlight to the province uh, the great working relationship that we have with them in many different areas um, and to invite them to think about how we might work together uh, on more areas. So I'm uh, supportive of the motion here. Um, is there any other discussion or debate on this portion before I would go to uh, Councillor Bressy? And again, uh, I, so uh, just Councillor Bressy did ask, and I appreciate you thinking about your colleagues. I see that Councillor Clayton has exited, and 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 uh, so she's obviously trying to solve her own technical issue there. Um, and so for that reason, I'm not going to say that we should take a, a pause. Uh, she can listen in. Uh, she's doing what she can to solve the technical matter. Um, it seems like everybody else is, is running okay, so I would imagine that it must be on, on her end or on her advice. Um, before I go to Councillor Bressy to close on this point, is there anybody else uh, that wish to make a comment? Seeing none, then I'll go to Councillor Bressy to close. Yeah, thank you. I just want to say I really do hear the concern about just uh, just a whole bunch of letters without an overall advocacy, st advocacy strategy. I really do understand that, and honestly, that makes... I don't know where I'm going on the on a future motion we've got in this meeting about a letter for that same reason. So I really understand and appreciate that. That being said, I, I think that this letter is worth writing for two reasons. A, I think it is one of the biggest challenges facing our community, but also I think it's something where we really do have something substantial to offer the government in terms of information. I in in January I got to have breakfast with Mr. Luan when with Minister Luan when the when caucus was up here. And he was very, and he was very surprised and pleasantly so about some of the partnerships we've got here in our community. I know, as I said on the opioid response task force, that we're very aware that we're, that there aren't many models like that in the province in terms of collaboration that's happening, not just between the municipality and the province, but the municipality and other organizations in the, in the community. And I really do think it's something that's unique, that's special, that's worthy of more provincial awareness and that the province actually isn't aware aware of. So sure, they get a lot of letters saying, hey, please do this, please do that, please do that, or please stop doing this. I don't know that if they get as many as many letters that actually have good information to offer. And I actually think we do have good information to offer in terms of the successful partnerships that we've got here that should be ex expanded on, not just for the sake of our community, but also for the sake of our province. So I hope council will support this motion. Okay, thanks for that uh, close, Councillor Bressy. Uh, so I'll call for the vote on Councillor Bressy's uh, uh, second part here. All those in favor? Okay, and any opposed? I see one opposed. Okay, and Councillor Bressy, if you'd like to continue. Great, and then my final one is, I would move that we direct administration to, in its 2021 budget recommendations, contrast any proposed increases to the RCMP budget alongside alternative investments of similar amounts that could be made into mental health care, addiction support, supportive housing, or preventative community development initiatives. And just speak to us uh, first, just a little bit of a technical piece for you folks. I, uh, I did before submitting my notice of motion, talk to di both Director Emanuel and Director Burke about this motion and would this be something that if it got passed that um, is it something they could action on? And I welcome if you want to ask them direct, directly, the, the, please, go, please go ahead. But they did tell me that this is an actionable request on both their parts. Although something that they did ask about is what's my intent of this in terms of increased costs such as just inflation. So cost of living increases or the cost of some supplies goes up because of inflation, things like that. And my intent of this motion is I don't need them to come and present and present those inflationary type increases. But if there's an increase because we're adding more officers, or if there's an increase like we saw last year where the RCMP kind of started doing their accounting in a slightly different way and realized they weren't operating full cost recovery. And so 
our contract went up very significantly way beyond the rate of inflation to the same level of service or if there's something that we're planning to do differently that costs more money, that those significant and unusual increases would come to council contrasted with other investments we can make. And I know that we're planning for an officer or two expansion every year for the next few years. I also know that, and I think it is worth us when an RCMP officer is one of the most expensive staff resources we have in the city. I really do think it is worth us having an intentional conversation of, is that the best bang for our buck? or are there other investments that could make better banks for a buck? I also think that we need to get used to having this conversation now because within the next couple of years, we're gonna be facing, we're gonna be facing an increase of millions of dollars due to collective bargaining. And as that comes, I think that we're gonna have a tough conversation of saying, is our RCMP detachment the right size when we see officers likely going up by 20 to 30% costs or or, or do we need to do some downsizing in order to make some other proactive investments in our community? I think that's a hard conversation we're gonna be having coming up. And so we should get used to having these conversations about the police, police budget now. And so I hope this passes. And the big thing that I would just highlight to council is I know in a lot of communities, there's been conversations about decreasing the RCMP budget. That's not the intent of this motion. It's not even the intent of saying, hey, we won't increase our police budgets. It's just saying, as increases come our way, let's be intentional about those. Let's not just let those automatically get in our budget. Let's look at those deliberately and compare them with other investments we could make before approving them. So I hope council will approve this. I think it's an important conversation we need to have in the fall. Okay, thanks, Councillor Bressy, for that introduction. I'll just do an audio check. Councillor Clayton, I see you back. Uh, do we get it this time? Can you hear me? Yes. Yay! Every, everybody's yeah. happy and jumping on screen. Okay, so Councillor yeah. Clayton, we're just on the final part of Councillor Bressy's motion, uh, which is reflected in the agenda uh, as point five there. Um, great. Um, so any discussion or debate on, on this motion? Um, I guess I, I do have that question for administration. I see Director Manuel on screen. Director Manuel, can you speak to how administration would handle providing those alternate, you know, alternate services, or how you would, how you'd go about providing um, some contrasting views? Like, uh, how would you do that at an administrative level? Yeah. So I think um, the points raised by Councillor uh, Bressy. Are, are very on point with the direction that administration has been headed anyways. Uh, one of the things that's unique to Grand Prairie is, you know, I'm the protective and social services director, which is a portfolio that's not very common, but a move we saw evolving over the last number of years. So when we did our last kind of four year budget and we started doing the shadow budgets, we were very, actually, we weren't even protective and social services when we undertook that exercise. I think uh, now the idea behind these kind of um, annual budget reviews is to assess, you know, how the, the world's changing around us, how the organization's changing. And uh, I think we have learned a lot about the integration in our portfolio um, and the way we're structured within the city. So I do believe it is reasonable that uh, there's certainly different ways to approach different challenges and, uh, you know, the city has different programs. Uh, we've entered some pilot projects, such as our mobile outreach, which is in a pilot phase. You know, depending on the program evaluation on that, uh, a reallocation may make sense. So the way we envision it, uh, I suppose, is I put some a preliminary thought to this, is uh, in the coming months, we, you know, we will continue to, one, assess the pilot projects and initiatives we have underway, both in the police service and within our, our other programs and continue to identify where some gaps exist in the community and see how we can have the most effective response to the issue at hand. And whether that be the police or that an alternative um, will represent where my recommendation at budget will come. So for instance, in the shadow budget, we have allocated funding and we're building the budget around three additional RCMP positions. Uh, the way I understand this motion, and frankly, we would have done this to some extent anyways, internally, is to see, okay, what, what emerging issues exist? Is that still the best investment? Or should we suggest to council we redirect it otherwise? So 
Um, I, I really just see this as being more transparent with the process we would have already probably undertaken. Thanks, Dr. Manuel. Uh, Councilor Clayton. Thanks, Mayor Gibbon. Um, I, I completely understand the intent with point five. I guess my concern is, is in one line where it says uh, similar amounts of investment, um, you know, safety and um, mental health go hand in hand. Great. Uh, however, I, I don't know the determination from administration of similar amounts. I'd like to see what administration rec recommends in this in regards to how it touches those buckets. You know, if it's mental health care, addiction support, supportive housing, there's, uh, and community development initiatives. There's so many sort of different portfolios there. To say that similar uh, budgeted amounts to the increased RCMP, I don't know if that's even realistic. So, you know, it sounds like Director Manuel has a fair understanding and, and they're already working on approaches to um, bring something to council. So I look forward to that discussion. I, For me, I just don't know about the uh, line of similar amounts because it could be significant amounts if we're going to start putting similar amounts to each of those buckets or is it collectively? So, um, you know, I have some concerns, but I look forward to what uh, administration brings forward in the fall budget. So I, I will support the motion as is. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Clayton. Um, I'll just uh, say one thing. At a, um, I'm not sure that I would suggest any amendments. I don't want to get into to changing the wording, but I guess a, a, a desire that I'd have or maybe some advice to administration would be this kind of contrasting might be done better in advance of budget um, so that you can get a bit of a sense, uh, kind of like Councillor Clayton's um, reference here. There's a whole bunch of different, so if you have an amount of money, uh, that you're saying, well, we can either do police or we could do one of these five different things with that amount of money or some small part of each of those things or whatever it is, you may want to get a sense from council in advance of budget so that council can make that, you know, inclusion at budget time. Um, budget discussions can obviously um, be pretty long as they are. And we would want to make sure, I would want to make sure that we had enough um, mental space and time to be able to discuss the way the administration's recommendations, um, where we can really be focused on that. Um, and then the outcome of that ends up at budget um, so that it really is, you know, that allocation happens at budget time where it should. So, um, I, I, and I don't think this motion prevents that kind of sequence, but just would really want council to be have enough time to think about that in advance of budget so that when it comes to budget, we're actually just making the allocation. Um, and so if, if you think that that's possible, Director Manuel, within the, the motion as it's worded, then I'm totally fine with uh, supporting the motion. Uh, so I, I, I certainly do believe that is uh, reasonable. I also know that I'm gonna have to, whatever I propose, uh, achieve council's buy-in and council's gonna have to have community buy-in. So I do appreciate we need some, some um, runway on this. Okay, good. As long as that's been heard, then, then I'm completely comfortable and happy to support the motion. Um, is there anybody else with any discussion or debate on, on this part of the motion? If there's not, then I'll go to Councillor Bressy to close. Great. Great. Thank you. No, I really appreciate the conversation and just, uh, just one point of clarification that I know I missed, but administration talked to me earlier about and highlighted for council is, um, not only in the next couple of years due to collective bargaining, are we going to see a couple million dollar per year operational increase? We're also likely to see a very significant one-time uh, retro pay payment. And my understanding is that retro pay, I don't think we're going to have much choice if we pay it or not. I don't think there'd be very much use to having the administration waste time on presenting alternatives to that. So for me, I don't intend for that retro pay to be included in this, in this motion, just that regular annual operational stuff. So just wanted to clarify that. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Bressy. Uh, so that was the close on the motion. I will call for the vote. All those in favor? Thank you. That motion carries unanimously. Uh, and I believe that handles all the business uh, related to this item and all of the items on our report section of our agenda. Uh, and we can move into committee business. Uh, and I think we're starting, uh, Councillor Minhas, with you in the Corporate Services Committee meeting. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Mayor Belgiven. And uh, I'll ask the Council to adopt the minutes of the Cooperative Services Committee meeting held on. Tuesday, July 7, 2020, uh, presented. Okay, thanks very much, Councillor Minhas. Any discussion or debate on that set of minutes? 
Seeing none, then I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Thank you. That motion carries unanimously. Anything to highlight from that set of minutes, Councilor Minhas? Yes, I got a couple of things to highlight. And it seems like uh, <laughs> administration had to work very hard. It's been broken them all. So it's getting narrowed down and it's just about time to break, I guess. All the departments are being back, back stopped slowly in, to monitor social distance, a remote work pilot project will be taking place over the next six months. And the assessment and taxation, taxation has been collected approximately one third of what is typically collected in June. And finance, the city has not yet, city has not yet had to use line of credit obtained as a backup due to COVID-19. So that's three items I have other than that. Great. Okay. Thanks very much for that update from the committee, Councilor Midhaas. Uh, I think that'll take us to item 8.3 in the Infrastructure and Economic Development Committee. Councilor Bressy. Great, thank you, but I think we missed the Community Services Committee. You're right, thank you. Thanks, Councilor Friesen. I was uh, had scrolled ahead. Uh, Councilor Friesen, go ahead. Oh, thank you very much. So I would like to move that Council adopt the minutes of the Community Services Committee meeting held Tuesday, July 7. Uh, 2020 as presented. Thanks, Councilor Friesen. Any discussion or debate on that set of minutes? Seeing none, then I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Thank you. That motion carries unanimously. Councilor Friesen, any highlights you'd like to give us? Thank you. I would like to mention that uh, we heard from Wayne Aylin, who's the general manager of Grand Prairie Live Theatre Society. Um, the society has experienced a um, lack of revenue coming in because of COVID and have uh, come to us to ask for additional funding on sort of an urgent basis. Um, what this made us realize is that, um, and, and hearing from some other community groups, is that there is room for um, a, a lot of groups who are going to be needing some uh, emergency funding. So we're actually um, going to establish a, a process. Council has asked uh, administration to establish a process to respond to urgent requests from, um, from community groups, especially as it's related to COVID-19 impacts. So that's happening. But the exciting stuff that's uh, really good to talk about is that we've got pools that are open now. Um, and I've heard that all of the public time slots are already booked for July. And um, so administration's looking at what else can be opened up so that we can really get um, everyone who wants to go swimming this summer into those places. Um, Monster Energy PBR Tour, which is a rodeo event, has been announced at Revolution Place for October 2nd and 3rd. It's a two-day event. And... Um, will there will actually be a portion of it broadcast on tsn nationally so this is a pretty cool um win for grand prairie to get this event and uh more so depending on how we're looking at that period of time we will be opening up as many seats as restric restriction restrictions will allow for um and in fleet uh it's pretty exciting that we've got a couple of new electric buses that are going to be online as early as this week so that's pretty exciting that's it for me thank you great thanks very much councillor friesen then i guess that takes us <laughs> to councillor bressy and uh, infrastructure and economic development great well thank you and i appreciate a bit of a break um i would move the council adopt the minutes of the infrastructure and economic development committee meeting held tuesday july 7th 2020 as presented Okay. Thanks, Councilor Bressy. Any errors or omissions, things we have to correct before we adopt those minutes? Seeing none, then I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Thank you. It looks like that motion was unanimous. Councilor Bressy. Great. I would move that Council direct the Mayor to write a letter to the Premier of Alberta, Cabinet, and local regional superintendents identifying the City of Grand Prairie's support for increased funding to school boards to enable the development of a plan that allows children to safely go back to school in person with regular traditional scheduling this September. And kind of where this comes out of is even though schools and health are provincial responsibilities, uh, this committee is 
half of its mandate is looking after the economy of Grand Prairie. And there's a real recognition that childcare is a very important part of our economy. If people can't have their kids cared for, then they can't work. And if kids can't get educated, then they're not ready to provide the workforce of tomorrow. Um, I'd also highlight on a personal level that childcare is especially important for, for women in the workforce. I think there's really good evidence that women are disproportionately affected, when, affected economically when childcare isn't readily available. And so that's why this is coming out of the out of the Economic Development Committee. I think there's a whole bunch of other reasons why schools opening would be great for our community, including mental health for our children and for and for our families. Uh, I know at the committee level there was a lot of conversation about should we just be advocating for schools to be open, or should we be advocating for funding attached to that? Uh, if we are advocating for funding, what kind of funding? I don't know, but suspect there might be some motions motions retouching on that made after this uh, but for but where the committee landed on that day was that it felt that we should be advocating the province for increased funding to make schools opening a safe thing uh, one other thing that i'll just point out to council where i made the motion as it was passed the committee but i wonder if we might want to look at is this motion if it passes would be we'd be writing to politicians and then regional local superintendents which seems a little bit weird to me I wonder if maybe we should consider amending it so we're writing school boards instead of superintendents. Um, but I'll leave that to my colleagues to see if anybody does have a desire to change that. Okay, thanks, Councillor Russi, and uh, thanks for introducing that. Um, I see you, Councillor Blackburn and Councillor Clayton. Um, I, I'll just say uh, at the committee level, uh, I was certainly spoke strongly in support of the need for increased funding. And if uh, there are council members that have a concern about that, about that being a primary part of the motion, I would be very open to uh, supporting an amendment that said uh, increased funding as required. Um, I don't make a, I can appreciate that it's possible the school districts may have ways that they could do this and not require additional funding. But I think for me, a central point is that if additional funding is required, the school boards need to have it. Um, and so that sort of as required would be uh, one compromise, I guess, that I'd be willing to offer. I'm um, not in a position, I don't think, to make an amendment. Um, but if there was one to sort of mute that, that the primary issue of the here is increasing funding, I'm not saying that it's just increased funding without sort of respect for any conditions. Um, but basically, I want, I, I, my concern is to be on record that if the school districts need funding to open up safely, that our desire is that the province should I'll, you know, provide that funding to them. So uh, just offer that uh, moderation of my position from the committee and a potential way to, to uh, address that in this motion if anybody wanted to make an amendment along that line. Uh, but Councillor Blackburn, I saw you there. Thank you, Mayor Given. So you're right, the, uh, the tenor of the motion has changed from, <clears throat> excuse me, what was originally introduced at the committee level. Um, the economic development concerns had to do with uh, uh, the economy more than, than anything else and getting kids back to school for a variety of reasons, including allowing parents to go back to work because they no longer have to have their kids at home, uh, certainly the mental health concerns and all the rest. And, um, and, and while I respect the idea that talking about the funding that would make that possible um, is, is an important part of it. Uh, the, the main concern is still, um, I think, uh, that council wants to um, impress upon the government our, um, um, our preference for uh, the, the option, uh, amongst the options that the government is considering to make sure that schools are open in September for all of those various reasons. However, my concern remains the same. And my concern is that although we've done very, very well here in the Grand Prairie, in the city and in the region to control outbreaks of COVID-19 uh, through the measures that we have taken, we need to recognize that the, um, the nature of the virus itself has not changed and that it is still as major a threat today as it was in March. And without the, uh, without the good measures that we've taken to prevent an outbreak from happening, um, the potential is 
as obvious uh, and, and as serious a threat today as it was back then. Um, so I think that we're talking about something that could be a potential uh, spark for a major outbreak in our city and in our region. And I also think that uh, this is a decision that is in the hands of um, school administration and health administration and that uh, we ought to keep our hands out of it because really what we're advocating for is a, a, a dangerous precedent uh, for a, a second wave. So I will not be voting in favor of this motion. Thanks, Councillor Blackburn. Uh, any other discussion or debate? I see uh, Councillor Clayton, Councillor Friesen, Councillor Pallott. Thanks, Mayor Gibbon. Um, as you mentioned, the intent of this motion was simply to show support for children to get back to school safely in a traditional model this September. Um, I have complete trust that uh, AHS and uh, the appropriate ministries will uh, prepare our students and our schools, uh, school boards and our uh, education system so that children are safe. Um, I have no doubt that our children, if they go back to school, will be in a safe environment. As in March, when the province was proactive and, and shut the school down within days, uh, if there's a uh, research and a strong um, second wave, I have confidence that they, again, will shut down the school uh, in a, an appropriate, quickly, proactive measure. I do think that uh, um, if, if people now, after learning the new models of education, feel that homeschooling is for them, then there are appropriate methods to be able to homeschool your own children. If sending your children back to school is not something you're comfortable with, or now you've realized that homeschooling is your preference, you will have an option. The survey that went out through Grand Prairie Public School District showed that 86% of parents want kids to go back to school and 90% of the students want to go back to school. The problem being that if we don't show our support, the school boards and the superintendent, uh, the province doesn't understand what our thoughts are. In order for our schools, our, our education, or rather our re economy to recover, our kids need to go back to school. Mental health, as, as noted, is in a strong uh, point to this. Uh, mental health support for uh, parents and students uh, is, is vital in, in being successful this September. Um, I don't um, think that increased funding is a reason um, or is something that we need to address with the province. I, I trust that the province will um, appreciate what the costs are um, and, and, and deal with that. The ad adequate amount of funding will be there in my opinion. And to mention any funding, uh, it, it, it seems like a bit of a money grab and it's not the intent of this motion. Um, I trust that uh, our children will be in a safe environment and I think that uh, funding has nothing to do with it. So I would like to amend the motion to remove the line uh, and I'm just pulling up the motion again to remove the line um, for increased funding to school boards uh, so that it would just say identifying Grand, City of Grand Prairie support for the development of a plan that allows children to go back to school in person with regular traditional scheduling this September. This isn't saying how we think they do it. This isn't saying uh, what it looks like. Operationally, we're not involved. It's simply showing our support as a city for kids to go back to school safely. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor Clayton. So that amendment is uh, obviously in order. Uh, it would strike the section uh, that says um, increased funding to school boards to enable, uh, and, and that would be the part that would be struck. Uh, so open for discussion debate on Councillor Clayton's amendment. Councillor Plott, and then Councillor Tool, then Councillor Friesen on the amendment. Uh, thanks, Mayor Gibbon. Uh, happy for the amendment. I'm glad that uh, Councillor Clayton beat me to it, but uh, I, I would be in full support of this. I've thought about this a lot since our conversation, and I can't get my head around in any way we need to tell the province that they need to, to, to spend money. Um, this is a province that's running billions in deficits. We're all running deficits, trying to figure out our way through COVID. I don't think we need to be redundant and say, make sure you're spending enough money to be open. They're going to they're gonna be open. They're going to choose to open safely if they choose to open, and they're going to figure this out. And so I, I don't know why we'd want to add any verbiage on there. Uh, and I want to be very cautious when I say this to you guys. We don't want to encourage any levels of government 
to, to justify any increased spending. They don't have to. I don't want to put any wording in there that allows them an opportunity to justify more spending. They might be able to do this without any spending another penny. Um, if they feel like they need to spend money, I have more than enough confidence that they'll spend the money and the adequate money they need to get schools open safely for our children. Um, we're running lots of deficits. They'll figure this one out. I just don't know why we want to put any wording around adequate funding or funding of any kind. It's not necessary in this motion. And I really hope council passes it the way it is. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Platt. Councillor O'Toole, then Councillor Friesen. Thank you very much, Mayor Gibbon. I sat in the committee meeting when this motion was brought up, and uh, I liked it at the very beginning when Councillor Clayton uh, brought worded it the way she did. Uh, and then there was some manipulation to the motion and to include money, and I did not feel comfortable about that. So at this point in time, I am supportive of the amendment. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Councillor Tool. Councillor Friesen? Thank you, Mayor Given. I'm not entirely sure whether I will support the overall motion. We'll see how it lands in the end, but I will support this amendment, not for any reasons um, that have been stated, but um, simply for a grammatical reason here. Um, as it's written and what has now been stricken is that we would support funding for boards to develop a plan. And I don't think that was what it meant. I think the the funding as we as it was spoken about was to actually um, enable the return to school, which is not the same as developing the plan to return to school. So I'm glad it's off the table now for different reasons. So I'll support the amendment and uh, not sure yet where I'll land overall. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Friesen. Um, I'll take the opportunity to speak against the amendment. Um, I think it's important that we do express our opinion that the province provides school boards the appropriate funding as required uh, and if necessary, uh, to enable uh, the safe reopening for schools. Um, I appreciate uh, the confidence expressed by uh, some council members that the province would do that just naturally anyways. Um, but I'll be really blunt, uh, the evidence over the last year has been that the province is not adequately funding a number of really important services and they are um, making different choices. And that's fully within the realm of the government's uh, jurisdiction. They can choose to do that. Uh, they can set their own priorities. Um, for me to be able to support this overall motion, um, and who, by the way, uh, wants my children and the children of this community to be able to go back to school uh, just as badly as anybody else. There's no debate on that. Um, but I think it's important uh, that we say that our school boards need to be adequately funded to enable that. If the province can do it, if the school board can do it within their current funding envelope, then that's great, uh, all the better. Um, but I do not want to see the provincial government download this responsibility uh, to school districts uh, for things that, um, uh, that might not be accounted for in their traditional budget. Um, that's my greatest concern. And I think we have seen over the last while uh, the provincial government um, spend resources in a number of different ways that are obviously in alignment with their priorities, and that's fine. Um, I think uh, for me, getting kids back to school is a priority for me and for this community. Uh, obviously, getting kids back to school safely is the greater priority. And ultimately, I believe that for our school boards to be able to do that, they may need, uh, and again, I'm open to the idea that it's a may, not a, not a shall, but that they may need additional funding. And I would like for us to be on record to say that uh, we think our school districts need the resources required to do the job properly. Um, I, I think that that's, a, for me, that's a central position. And uh, I don't think I'd be able to support, uh, I'll, I'll have to think if I'd be able to support the motion without it. Uh, but I would just ask my council members uh, to really, uh, really think about whether uh, you individually think it's reasonable for us to say to the province, funding schools in this circumstance to the level that they need to be funded is the right thing to do. Uh, I certainly fall on the side of yes, it is. And that's why I won't be able to support this motion. The, the, excuse me, the amendment. Councillor Thiessen, then Councillor Bressy. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Given. Um, I, I would like to be able to support this amendment, but again, uh, as just reiterating what the mayor said, um, if the amendment was for appropriate or adequate funding, I mean, even the verbiage there doesn't necessarily imply that they have to increase the funding or that we've made a judgment that their funding isn't right. 
Uh, but yeah, you know, part of our job as, as community elected officials is that we're advocates for our entire region. So um, we want to advocate for the safest uh, return to school as possible. And with that's going to come significant investments. And what does that look like? I don't know. Uh, the province is going to determine that through Alberta Health Services and, and their own timeline, really. Um, we don't know what's happening, like with coronavirus or even if we'll be able to go back to school. But I understand the economy is important. But for the greater health of our people, I think there are investments that need to be made and we can't just turn on our blinders and we have to push the government. This is our role, is we have to push the government to do what's right and to be right in their approach. Um, to simply say, hey, you know what, send kids back to school because it's good for the economy. Well, I think the UCP is going to do that. But are they going to invest in a safe return to school is another question. And if, if us as municipally elected officials or public school trustees or parents uh, want uh, the safest return to school, that is going to come with investments. And while we're handing out millions and billions of dollars to oil companies and other businesses, we also need to take into account that it is our health system that keeps us healthy and our school system that keeps us educated so we can improve upon our health in the future. So um, kids now, today, and in the future, uh, I think it is our role to at least point out the fact that this is going to have investment, and I don't think they're daft. I think the UCP and, our, and the government understand that there's going to be money here, but we need, to be, we need to be specific and pointed and say, hey, if this is going to happen, make sure you do it right so that we're not going backwards uh, after we get kids in school. So uh, for all those reasons, I can't support the motion as it is, but if uh, appropriate or adequate seems to be a better uh, verbiage tone uh, for this motion instead of increased, um, then I mean, I can get behind that, but this I can't, thanks. Okay, thanks, Councillor Friesen, Councillor Bressy. Great, thank you. Yeah, I'm largely with Councillor Thiessen in terms of I can't support this amendment because it goes too far. I probably could support, if, if, if this amendment fails and another one was made that moderated the language, I'd probably support that. And for me, I think that it's as education cuts have been, as education cuts have been happening and there have been real cuts when you factor in the growth of students and inflation in our school boards, the kids and the families that are most impacted are the most vulnerable. Where I know our kids' speech therapy has been hugely vital to our kids. And we just got the notice that probably not going to, that there's a good chance our youngest isn't going to get speech therapy that he needs next semester. And that's okay by our family. I work for the city. I've got some private benefits. And if those aren't enough, my family will figure it out. There's a lot of families, though, who either aren't in the financial situation I am in, or else their kids have way more complex needs than my kids have. And they are going to be completely devastated by the lack of specialized support, support in their schools. And I think that that disproportionately affects our community more than other communities for two reasons. A, we're a community where a lot of families are far away from their families and their support networks. And when they have a kid who struggles with specialized needs, it hurts them a lot more than it does families in other communities that have more support. But also we're a community that can't get enough therapists, psychologists, and all those services for these families. They're more expensive partners come, come by here. And I think that we get hit harder for that. I also think that we're a community that because our school board, school boards and our population is young and growing faster than it is a lot of the province, these cuts hurt our community more than others. So I think if there are cuts made to the specialized services or the education of the kids to, um, to fund COVID responses, I do think that hurts our community more than it hurts many other communities in the province. So I think that it's, I, I do think, I do agree that the, I don't love that the motion as it's on the table without an amendment assumes increased funding is needed. I think that there is room to moderate that, say, hey, if there is increased funding we, needed, we, we support that, not just assuming that. So I think that this could be moderated, but to not talk about funding at all, I think that risks. Okay, thanks, Councillor Bressy. Um, I will just, I see you, Councillor Clayton. Uh, we'll just see if there's any other comment on the amendment. Uh, before we go to Councillor Clayton to close. Councillor Clayton. Thanks, Mayor Gibbon. Um, I can appreciate the comments made in regards to overall funding of, of education systems, healthcare systems. Um, 
to be honest, those are two huge beasts that the province and the government deal with on a daily basis. Um, there's a lot spent in those departments. There's a lot of time and, and evaluation looked in those departments in regards to how to make them more efficient, to make the service models better. Um, sometimes it requires less funding, but this has nothing to do with um, the overall system. This, in my opinion, is the fact that um, we trust that the government will not put these children in school if it's unsafe. Uh, and, and in order to do that, they would need to provide the appropriate adequate funding. To identify any funding in this motion simply makes the motion um, not as strong in regards to the fact that we support our kids going back to school. Um, as mentioned in the survey, the Six ki Sick Kid Hospital in Toronto Centre did a massive report on what kids going back to school look like. There's lots of reports out there currently of how kids can get back to school safely. The province is not going to do this uh, by putting the kids at risk. It doesn't require uh, a mention of money. And I encourage council to stick with the intent of the motion that kids need to go back safely to school in person this September. Thanks for that close, Councillor Clayton. Uh, so we'll call for the vote on Councillor Clayson, Clayton's amendment, which would delete uh, the words after um, uh, including increased funding to school boards uh, to enable. And then, uh, so the motion would read, yeah, th so that's the part that would be deleted. Um, we will call for the vote. All those in favor of Councillor Clayton's amendment to remove that section. Thank you. And all those opposed? I see three opposed, so that motion to amend does carry. And we're back on to the main motion as amended. Any discussion on the main motion as amended? Councillor Blackburn. Thank you, Mayor Gavin. And I know I've already spoken to this once, but I feel that I need uh, to offer a bit of rebuttal to the comments that uh, Councillor Clayton made about uh, uh, about her trust in the uh, uh, health and education folks uh, being able to make it safe for children. I agree that it will be, uh, one way or another, it would be safe for children. But, but what really scares me is the comment that said, if there was another outbreak, outbreak, the schools would be shut down as quickly as they were the first time and that children would be safe. Well, my, my concern is not for the children because I know that one way or another, they will be kept safe. My concern is for those people that um, are, um, are likely to be at risk as a result of an outbreak. And even though children may not be seriously affected by um, uh, a spread of the virus, um, there's every possibility that uh, being asymptomatic, they will carry the virus into the community. And uh, that's something that I can't risk. And I know that there are many other people that can't risk it as, as well. So uh, again, I would say that I don't want it to be partially on the city's lap that we encouraged uh, a dangerous move. So I will not be supporting the motion. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Blackburn. Uh, any other discussion on the main motion now as amended? Seeing none, then I will call for the vote on the motion. All those in favor? Thank you. I see three, four in favor and all those opposed? I see five opposed, so that motion does not carry. Uh, so we will move on. That was uh, all the um, details on that item. Uh, we'll move on to any updates from the Infrastructure and Economic Development Committee from Councilor Bressy. Great, thank you, Mayor Gibbon. Um, so a, a few highlights is one that I know will interest some councilors is engagement is underway on the, uh, on the transportation offsite levy. There's going to be some bylaw amendments coming to council. Just make sure that the money we take we take from developers to fund future infrastructure is the appropriate amount and it's well planned. So I think that's that's well maybe not exciting, but I think it's very beneficial that 
administrations do their due diligence with that levy. Uh, to, something that it, that really is exciting to me personally is already the robotic mower is deployed in the city and the robotic mower that ha also does some snow removal. It's been working very well on some very easy to mow areas and now it's being used on some more challenging to mow tasks uh, such as road, bo road boulevards and areas with slopes. And that's really exciting to me because I think that if this technology pans out and does well, it's a potential for us to mow our grass more, so give higher level service. It's also a potential for us to do that for less, for potentially less money, which is great for taxpayers. And also it's just a way to do it safer, where mowing, especially on a slope beside a road, actually can be quite a dangerous task for the operator. And so if a robot can be risking, its, risking itself rather than an employee, that's good, that's good for everyone. Uh, the other thing that somebody might notice is the city is currently doing some naturalization. So that means less mowing in some of our dry ponds and wet ponds around the city. And there's a number of benefits to that, including budgetary savings, some environmental benefit, depending on your perspective, maybe some aesthetic improvements. Um, but something that residents will notice is it probably, a lot of them don't look great right now and might not look great for a year or two. But we know from naturalization of well of highly maintained areas in other municipalities that you take a year or two for the natural grasses to outcompete the weeds and it'll look great in the long run. But if anybody's wondering, why aren't we mowing those ponds? Well, that's why, because in the long run, we're going to make sure they're looking great, but also costing taxpayers a lot less money while also being great for the environment. Um, and I think that's all I need to share from that committee. Okay. Thanks very much, Councilor Bressy. Um, Director Glavin, did you have something to add? Thank you, Mayor Given. Yes, I just wanted to uh, circle back. There were a couple of questions that were asked at committee that I have some answers to that I could share for uh, the public's benefit. Uh, there was a question around a, um, a curb that was installed along 116th Avenue and 97th Street over by Crystal Ridge uh, that it wasn't flat faced to allow for uh, strollers or any, um, anything with wheels or anybody with mobility issues to get across. Uh, that was an error in the construction that will be corrected this summer. Uh, regarding how we treat construction zones in the city and the speed limit, we do have the contractors uh, file traffic accommodation plans. So this uh, determines what the speed limits will be at different stages of construction. Uh, I know we do get complaints from time to time about uh, areas that are 30 kilometers an hour for uh, times outside of when the workers are working. This happens specifically when there are excavations uh, present. So uh, 84th Avenue over by 116th Street would be a perfect example of this right now where there's an open excavation and the speed limit is 30 kilometers an hour for the duration until that's brought back to grade. Uh, versus others where it's just when workers are present that it's 30 and then the uh, signs are turned down when they're not present. Um, there was also a question about uh, adding a turning lane at um, on 92nd Street into Countryside North. Uh, that was not included in the work uh, that is being done this summer, but we're going to look at a, a temporary improvement there outside of our capital program. Uh, that might take care of the issue in the short term and then uh, have that uh, included in one of the future uh, upgrades in that area. And that's all. Okay. Thanks. Thank, thanks for that, Director Glavin. Uh, I think that takes us now uh, through all of our committee business and up to the Council Committee of the Whole meeting uh, from July 8th. Can I get a motion for that set of minutes? Councillor Plot. Uh, uh, sorry, Mayor but I just was going to make my I committee keep, meeting. Sorry, you're 100% you're <laughs> right. Sorry, I keep, yeah, my apologies. Well, I, we keep trying to get no further worries. ahead. No worries. We just want to try to get through the committee stuff, but I'll just make a motion that the uh, council uh, adopt a protective and social services committee meeting held Tuesday, July the 7th. Thanks very much, Councilor Plot, and apologies again. Uh, any discussion or debate on that set of minutes? Seeing none, then I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Thank you. That motion carries unanimously. Anything to highlight, Councilor Plot? Yeah, thanks, Mayor Given. Uh, recruitment is underway for new board members for our community advisory board on homeless and, uh, homelessness. So hopefully uh, we get some new members for cap on that. And the RCMP uh, administration is continually working with the summer scheduling and proactive planning for what we're going to do in September regarding COVID. 
Thanks very much, Councillor Platt. Okay, fine. Now we can go to the Council Committee the whole minutes. Um, can I get a motion for that set of minutes? Councillor Thiessen? Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Given. I would move that Council adopt the minutes of the Council Committee of the whole meeting held Wednesday, July 8th, 2020, as presented. Thanks, Councillor Thiessen. Any discussion or debate on that set of minutes? Seeing none, then I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Thank you, that motion carries. Councillor Thiessen, I guess, if you wanna start with the uh, motions rising. Might as well, I, I figure uh, it could be more expedient to go all as one, but it uh, sounds like we've had some debate and some change motions already. So I'll just read one. And if I have to read them all later, then that's fine, or we can interchange. But I'll start by moving that council remove the Grand Prairie Public Library from community group funding process to a separate grant funding process. Now, uh, speaking to this motion, there was a lot of discussion uh, was brought up by Councillor Blackburn to do this. Uh, actually, the libraries being in our community group funding is relatively new since the Municipal Government Act just got changed uh, and it was placed in with other community group fundings. This is sort of a, let's go back to the old way because even though we know we can, maybe there's a different value system to the library. Well, not maybe, there is a different value system to the library and what it does to our community. So we took it out of the overall community group funding and this is a motion just to approve that. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Councillor Thiessen. Any discussion or debate on this motion? Seeing none, then I will call for the vote. All those in favor? Thank you, that motion carries unanimously. Uh, Councillor Thiessen, do you wanna continue on with the next one? Might as well. Uh, I would move that council approve funding for the Grand Prairie Public Library in the amount of $1,650,000. And I'll just leave it open at that. Okay, uh, that motion is open for discussion and debate. Uh, any discussion or debate on that point? Seeing none, then I will call for the vote on that motion. All those in favor? Thank you, that motion carries unanimously. Uh, Councillor Thiessen, if you're still up for it, keep going. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to rock and roll. Uh, I would move that council approve funding for the Grand Prairie Sport Council in the amount of $108,000. Now, uh, administration, just speaking to this motion, administration had recommended a much lower amount, but council, I think, through discussion and recognizing the impact of sports has and uh, and I guess the ability of Sport Connector to do be a little bit more nimble in uh, bringing events and supporting uh, coaching within the area as well as uh, other try days and stuff like that to get people active and involved. Uh, council uh, through discussion thought that it was appropriate to keep it the same, maybe just a little bit higher, I think from the previous year. So for all those reasons, uh, it was unanimous at the CCW and maybe it'll be unanimous today, but that's my motion. Okay, thanks, Councillor Thiessen. Any discussion or debate on this motion? Again, seeing none, then I will call for the vote. All those in favor? Thank you, I believe that motion carried unanimously. Councillor Thiessen. Uh, this is a simple motion just to remove the ones that we just talked about, but I would move that uh, Council support the funding recommendations as presented in attachment A, which is attached to our agenda, except for the Grand Prairie Library Board and the Grand Prairie Sport Council because we had actually increased the funding for both of these organizations. So we're gonna remove this out of the recommendations. Council is aware of that, public may not be, but that's the motion, thanks. Okay. Thanks very much, Councilor Thiessen. Uh, and this would also have the effect of uh, approving all of the other funding recommendations for the other sport, or, or excuse me, for all the other community groups that were listed there. Um, and so, uh, so this is actually the one that approves administration's recommendation for funding levels for all the other groups other than those two. In attachment A, thanks for that, Bill. Um, any discussion or debate on that motion? Seeing none, then I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Thank you, and any opposed? I see one opposed. Go ahead, Councillor Thiessen. Thank you, Mayor Given. I would move that Council approve funding for the Grand Prairie Volunteer Services Bureau in the amount of $25,000. Now, speaking to this motion, uh, administration did not recommend the, the Volunteer Services Bureau to receive any funding. They did apply for, I believe it was $116,000, uh, which I think was a little rich for Council, but I tried to make it 50 uh, and amend Councillor Friesen's original motion of 25, but Council settled on this number in recognition of the 
incredible uh, amount of support that the Volunteer Services Bureau gives to our community, our community groups, uh, and for the work that they've done. And also recognizing that, uh, in part, um, they're also dealing with what everyone else is dealing with now, a decrease in funding. They lost $200,000 of their provincial job grant. Uh, and this is just to sort of help them keep on the feet, keep them on their feet and get them doing what they do best, which is, you know, helping our community grow and thrive in the spirit of volunteers. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Peason. Any discussion or debate on this motion? Again, seeing none, I will call for the vote. All those in favor? Thank you. Uh, are there any opposed? So I just want to check. Uh, Councillor Minhas, you are in favor? Yeah. Okay. Or Councillor Minhas, are you in favor or are you opposed? Opposed? Opposed, yeah. Okay. Thank you. One opposed. Thank you. Uh, and then we have one final motion, Councillor Thiessen. Thank you, Mayor Given. I would move that Council approve the 2021 capital funding as presented in Attachment B. And it's simply there for the public to see as well. Uh, some capital requests were made. The administration sorted through that. Council sorted through it. And uh, small investments, but large for the groups that applied. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Thiessen. Any discussion or debate on this final motion? Again, seeing none, then I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Thank you. It looks like that motion passed unanimously. I'm done. Thanks, Mayor Given. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Thiessen. Thanks for taking that on. Uh, looks like that handles all the business from that Council Committee of the Whole. Um, we had no items of correspondence this evening, um, but we did have, obviously, our delegations, um, and a couple of those were not dealt with uh, with other items on our agenda. Obviously, the ones with respect to the development permit and the supportive housing proposal were both sort of otherwise dealt with with agenda items. Um, Council Bressy. Great. Thank you, Mayor Given. I'd like to make one for the bandage pod, pause delegation, and it's a bit of a longer motion for, so for the sake of our recording secretary, I'll, I'll read it, but I'm also just putting it in the chat. Um, but I would move that council direct administration to bring to the appropriate standing committee a report identifying city resources dedicated to caring for seized, abandoned, and stray animals and enter into opportunity, and sorry, and identify opportunities to enter into or expand partnership opportunities with nonprofits to ensure the viability of current services in our community. And kind of where I'm going with this is I honestly don't understand what we do on the city side and what happens on the nonprofit side to care for animals that need extra care for. I don't understand how much money we spend as a city right now. And before I talk about opportunities to, so, to increase our support to nonprofits, I need to understand what we're already doing better. So I'd like to know that. Um, and then also, I think that it does make set a lot of sense probably for us to support bandage paws on on an ongoing on an ongoing basis. At the same time, I don't think it would be appropriate for us to say, "Hey, that's our that's the nonprofit we're working with," unless administration rec recommends that for us. So I, le I left that vague as to as to as to the organization that we might work with, so that administration, if they've got other ideas, they can present those to us. Okay. Uh, open for discussion or debate on the motion. Councillor Thiessen. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Given. Just a question to Councillor Bressy. Um, I guess uh, I, I'm not up to date on our on our bylaws for, I guess, the impoundment and stuff like that. I'm not sure if that would be addressed in there. Um, but I guess my question is, we have uh, Grand Prairie Live Theatre had asked for some emergency funding, Bandage Paws asked for some emergency, fun emergency funding, and we have uh, directed administration to compile um, a list of the requests and asks that council can go through, because we know there's going to be more. Uh, is your intention with this second part of this motion is to bring it back with that report with GPLT and other not-for-profits in the community? No, so what I was hearing from Bandage Paws, Bandage Paws was, correct me if I was mishearing, but what I was hearing wasn't that this is necessarily an emergency COVID response. It's, I think what, I think what I'm hearing is that there's uh, maybe a more systemic issue with the uh, ability for them to, to operate in a, vi in a viable manner that's not just a short-term thing like other nonprofits are facing. So I honestly don't understand the landscape enough, but I think that we did see a uh, nonprofit in a similar space as Bandage Paws um, go 
not, show itself not to be viable a few years ago. And I don't know if the, if, and um, I think that if Bandage Paws went under, my sense is that that would probably lead to uh, some massively increased cost to the city. So it might be worth shoring them up. And also I wonder if there's opportunities of when the last one went under, I wonder if there's opportunities that the city's taken over some things and kept some things on our plate that we don't necessarily have to have on our plate. And so I'd like to know if there's opportunities to ask a nonprofit that can operate way more efficiently than us to do some of the services we're doing right now. And also I'd be, uh, I should point out, I've saying the city a lot. I know that the county, this is one area where we work very good with the county and that they're, that we've got a very good partnership with them. So I don't mean to be snubbing them at all. I really do appreciate the county's partnership with us in this. Okay, and I appreciate that, Councillor Bressy. Um, and uh, for your explanation, I think I too need to grow in my understanding and knowledge uh, with what, uh, you know, our, I guess, four-legged friendly service organizations are providing to our community. Uh, and I look forward to seeing a report of that, as well as I was pointed out that uh, you did mention the county, uh, which we know is we're partnered up in, at the pound, uh, potentially where they might fit in this as well. Um, you know, to support an organization that is supporting supporting both uh, the city and the county, I think is important. And I think that should be included in the report. But uh, I, I wasn't sure I was going to support it because it seemed like a very standalone. But uh, sounds like you put a little bit of thought into it in the meantime, and so I will support it. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Beeson. Um, I'll just I'll just say I, I appreciate the thought that went into this. I wonder if if we're overthinking it a bit. <laughs> um, it, th this would have for me, just being a refer the request from Bandage Paws to the appropriate standing committee, um, because I would note that they mentioned that they had already talked to our administration, so I think they're aware of what the request is. And then at the standing committee, we would have an opportunity to ask for any additional information that we that wasn't already provided in the report. Um, yeah, so I, I, yeah, and this is starting to be a bit more. It's very long in its intention to not be prescriptive, I think. I think you're trying to get a holistic system review and you're not trying to limit that review to a narrow area. And so that's had taken more words <laughs> to be able to sort of get it in there. And I think if we, you know, we had an external request from a partner that we work with that said, hey, we've, you know, we just want to start this conversation. And uh, for me, this would be a, okay, fair enough. Let's start that conversation and get this on the agenda of the appropriate standing committee. Um, but I'm, I'm concerned that this uh, motion might cloud what, what our actual intention is there. Um, uh, we'll look at to the, uh, Director Glavin has changed a little bit. <laughs> uh, you, your camera's pointed uh, down or it's moved up or something and you've changed your hair color. Uh, but I see the Director of uh, Protective and Social Services. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I apologize, the meeting duration killed my battery so I've switched uh, computers. So uh, anyways, um, as was mentioned, uh, what Bandage Pause is requesting is uh, essentially the return to a framework that we previously had in place and one that we had agreed to with uh, the Edmonton Humane Society but didn't come to fruition. So it, it's not really new territory for us. Uh, it's not going to take us long to bring it back. And um, I, I think we have a document that supports both what the county motion, county council had a motion they made that's in alignment with what uh, Bandage Paws is seeking. And I think we'll likely be able to, um, at committee, bring that forward rather quickly. Uh, I don't think it'll be too convoluted. Okay, okay. thanks, Director Manuel. Um, <laughs> uh, and thanks to whoever's on administration changing names. Good job, Councilor Bressy. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like what Director Manuel is talking about is some, is really the intention of this. So, if the chair and council would like, I'd be happy to change. I'd be happy to withdraw my motion and make it just refer to the appropriate standing committee. Because it sounds like what I want is in one is it one is in process. But I'm also happy to to let it stand. But I'll leave that up to the chair. Sure. Well, Council Resty, it's your motion, and if you're comfortable sure. with, why don't I say just refer to the standing appropriate standing committee then? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Or if we're all comfortable with that, is there any need for any other discussion or debate on that referral? Seeing none, then I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? That motion carries unanimously. Sorry, uh, we did also have 
um, our presentation from the Council Remuneration Review Committee. Um, as noted there, there were a few things maybe that we would need to tighten up some of the language or provide some additional definition. Um, I certainly don't take any issue with the recommendations, um, but there may be a couple of items that, that weren't considered by the committee in terms of how we could get some specifics in there. And I wonder if this is also a refer to the appropriate standing committee. So we could do some of those minor touch-ups. Councillor O'Toole? Yes, Mayor Given. I think that uh, I would like to make a motion that we refer to the uh, appropriate committee. Uh, I think there's some descriptions and uh, understanding that needs to be uh, dealt with, and uh, I think we can do that at committee. Thank you. Thanks, Council Tool. Any discussion or debate on that motion? Um, and I see Council Rissi. Uh, you know, with this, it would go to the appropriate standing committee, and then obviously would come back to Council ultimately for approval of the policy. So all Council members would still have a chance to vote on this um, before. Uh, before we move forward. Councilor Ressi. Thank you. I don't know if it would be dealt with with this motion or what people's intents are, but I saw two re I saw two requests from them. One was to approve the policy, which I think is very appropriate sense committee, but they also asked us to acknowledge that their work is completed. And I think what I hear there is some volunteers saying, hey, do you still need us? Should we plan that we're still on this committee or is this committee done? So I don't know what council thinks of, are we hoping that we're able to call them back again to answer questions or... Should we pass this motion, talk about the policy, then do another motion saying we consider the work done? I just think that there's two requests here and maybe this is just touching the policy request. Fair, fair enough, I think that's a fair point. Um, if this motion passed, I suppose council could decide whether we wanted to leave the option open to call them back or if we think that their work's done without, uh, and we could do that, indicate that with the follow-up motion as they recommended. Any other discussion or debate with Councillor O'Toole's motion to refer this policy to the appropriate standing committee? Seeing none, then I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Thank you, that motion carries unanimously. Uh, uh, so Council Bressy, did you wish to make another motion on that second part? Sure, yeah, I will make that motion then. Um, I would move the council acknowledge that the council remuneration review committee has completed their work as required. I think that it's, we could let them off the hook. I think if we've got it, I think that it's pretty clear what they, what they wanted. I'm not worried about needing their input. I'm sure that there are also people in the community, I'm sure if, we really do run into issues. We could call the chair and get some clarification, but I think it's great to tell these highly busy, highly engaged people, hey, this doesn't have to be in your mental space anymore, and thank you for your work. And so, actually, I'm going to change that slightly. I'm going to say move the council, acknowledge the council remuneration review committee has completed their work, and thank you, and thank them for their efforts. Yeah, great. Thanks very much, Council Bressy. Any discussion or debate on that motion? Seeing none, then I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Motion carries unanimously, thank you. Uh, I think that handles all of our business off our agenda. Uh, we do have a scheduled delegation for six o'clock. So council members, I think that gives us enough time uh, to be able to take a bit of a break. Uh, if you're in your own home, to be able to grab something to eat. Uh, but that scheduled delegation is for six o'clock. Uh, so we will return then and uh, continue with the rest of the council meeting then. Um, and we'll see you all in a few more minutes. And the same Zoom or different? Uh, I believe the same Zoom link, Councillor Minhas. Yeah. Thank you. See you soon.
one. Uh, welcome back to the second half of the Grand Prairie City Council meeting for July 13th, 2020. Uh, we're back in our uh, um, scheduled delegation portion of our agenda. Um, we had uh, two presenters let us know ahead of time that they wish to present to council. Uh, Drs. Brianna Hudson and Alika Lafontaine are here. Um, for those of you that are presenting, uh, Dr. Drs. Hudson and Lafontaine, I'd ask, invite you to join us at the council table by turning on your microphone and turning on your camera. Um, and uh, for anybody else that's here attending as an observer, um, we will acknowledge you, uh, but I would just ask in terms of preserving bandwidth for all the users, if you could just keep your video turned off and your microphones turned off, uh, that'll help make sure that we don't have uh, as many of the hiccups that you can get with technology. Um, with that, uh, we'll turn it over uh, to Drs. Hudson and uh, LaFontaine. Dr. Hudson. Thank you. Um, thanks very much to everyone on council for being interested in having us speak. And uh, we look forward to speaking with you this evening. I'm here with Dr. Alika Lafontaine um, and I'm uh, Dr. Brianne Hudson. I'm a family physician and I've been here in Grand Prairie since 2011. I did my residency training here, which is two years long and then decided to stay. And I own a clinic here called Pioneer Medical Clinic. Uh, Dr. Alika Lafontaine uh, will be speaking later in the presentation. And he is uh, an anesthesiologist who's been here, I think about the same amount of time as I have. And uh, he's also the chief of the anesthesiology department and can offer some insights into how these um, provincial government changes are impacting specialists. So we're coming to you as a united front as both generalist and specialist to let you know how these changes are impacting us. I'd like to just make mention as people were coming on and forgive me those of you um, that are on Zoom right now if I don't mention you, um, but there was a few names that popped up that I'd like to make mention of. So we have several physicians that are online uh, to listen to the discussion today. Uh, so I'd just like to make mention that we have uh, Dr. Daryl Barty, Dr. Brad Martin, uh, and Dr. Skulk Vandermeer. And these are all other family doctors that work in Grand Prairie. We also have Dr. Derek Mock, who is a general surgeon here in Grand Prairie on the line. Uh, we also have Tammy White, who is a pharmacist that works at the hospital. And I'd also like make, to make mention of Mika DeGroote, who works with the Spinal Cord uh, Injury Association. Um, so the, the title of the presentation is, is Let's Act Now, and it's talking about our concern about the threat to Albertans um, as our healthcare system fails. Next slide, please. And I already did the introduction, so we can go to the next slide. So I'm gonna create the context. Now, some of you may be very familiar with this and some of you may not be. So last year, um, the UCP government tore up the master agreement with the Alberta Medical Association. So we've had a master agreement in place um, through our medical association for years. And, and this agreement was simply canceled. Um, I'm not sure if this has ever happened in the history of Alberta. And the uh, proposed changes were going to mean massive pay cuts for physicians and speaking in terms of uh, the impact of family doctors, it was predicted that our pay would be cut by about 30%. Um, so the average family doctor in Alberta makes $300,000. Uh, but we need to remember that on average, 30% of that goes to overhead costs. So if I'm running a clinic, obviously there are costs associated with that. Um, and then on top of that, we have to consider taxes and other things. So um, while the government uh, will talk about the amount of money that physicians are making, I'd encourage you to keep in mind that we don't all make the same. And also some physicians and, and also my specialist colleagues have some pretty high overhead costs that need to be adjusted for. Um, so ophthalmology would be another example of that. Um, so under these changes, uh, family doctors were going to lose their complex care modifiers. And so if uh, basically under the healthcare system, what pays the most money is to see a patient every five minutes. 
um, as a family doctor, that will pay you the most money. Um, however, that is not how many of us like to practice. If we have complex patients and we take over 15 minutes to treat that patient, then under the previous system, we could bill extra to treat those patients. So there would be time modifiers in 10 minute increments where we would make a little bit more. Now, if I see two patients an hour, I still make less than, making, than seeing a patient every five minutes, but I can still pay my overhead and, and uh, make a living doing that. Now, the proposed changes by the government, we're going to take those complex modifiers away. Um, and it's true that in some other provinces, they, they um, practice medicine without those time modifiers. Um, however, we feel that we're able to provide much better care and the patients don't have to come back to the clinic as frequently. As well, we can manage complex cases much more easily if we're compensated for our time. Now, I will say that those um, changes to the complex mo modifiers have been reversed at this point. However, many physicians are still concerned because we have no master agreement. So at any time, the changes could simply be re-implemented again. I will also mention that the radiologists um, of the Grand Prairie Hospital had a contract that was canceled by our government. Um, and the situation has become so dire that the AMA is actually suing the Alberta government. Um, and again, even though some of these cuts have been reversed, physicians as a whole have really lost trust in the UCP government. And this is gonna make it very challenging for, for us to move forward unless we start to see change. Uh, next slide, please. Just bringing it into yeah, the local context. Um, so currently Grand Prairie has 46 family doctors. Last year, we lost 10. Um, now, every year is a little bit different. Last year was a, a, a bad year. We lost a big number, but, that, but that's quite significant. That's a number we need to pay attention to. And this was before all of this political stuff started to happen. Um, so even before losing the 10 family doctors, the PCN um, walk-in clinic, they do a poll of all the patients that come into their clinic. And typically their poll show that 32% of people in Grand Prairie don't have a family doctor. I suspect that number is quite a bit higher now. We're probably looking at 40% or possibly more. Um, and of course you have people that aren't going into the walk-in clinic either, right? So the number might actually be higher. Um, so myself and my colleagues are concerned that now if, if already Grand Prairie is in this tenuous state of keeping family doctors and retaining family doctors, what's going to happen now that all of this political turmoil is going on? Um, family medicine is quite a demanding career. It is rewarding. Um, personally, I find it very rewarding to follow my patients over time. Um, it is a less lucrative area of medicine and in Grand Prairie family doctors do a lot of different jobs and so some family doctors that are trained in family medicine end up exclusively working in the emergency department or exclusively working in a hospital um, for various reasons including that it's more lucrative or that it's easier to maintain a work-life balance. Um, there's also specialized areas of practice that some family doctors will switch to. So in terms of the family doctors that left last year, some chose to um, close practices but enter into emergency medicine or specialized medicine. Some um, left to do extra training and potentially will come back as specialists. Some decided that they simply didn't want to live in Grand Prairie and moved. Um, so knowing that we lost 10 last year, um, I think it just brings home the point that we need to pay attention to how the current political state of affairs is affecting morale. Um, so healthcare for Albertans is definitely at risk. Um, I will email out a summary document that will go along with this presentation. So there is a website by Kim Seaver that keeps track of all the clinics and facilities that are being impacted by um, these government changes. So clinics that are offer offering reduced services, a change in services, 
in response to the government cuts and basically due to, to fears that people are not going to be able to um, maintain their livelihoods with with the funding cuts and due to uncertainty um, due to this government. Um, a number of physicians have pledged that they are leaving the province and new grads particularly are uh, reporting that they're hesitant to stay in Alberta. Um, so, so that is worrisome as well. There are some cases of rural emergency departments which have closed or are looking for large numbers of locums um, because their staff has said it, it's just, it just doesn't make sense for them to continue to offer those services. Um, so Sundry Hospital is one example of a hospital in Alberta that um, has had to close acute care services. And Pincher Creek had a locum, so locums are, are replacement doctors that fill in when doctors are away. Pincher Creek had nine postings, like that is fairly unheard of that, that um, a small community would need nine locums. So it's a sign that their doctors are, are pulling out. One other quick point is um, a colleague recently informed me that um, right now there are 170 postings for international doctors for Alberta. So I think we need to keep that in mind. It seems that the Alberta government is potentially trying to attract international doctors that would be unaware of the current situation, um, willing to work for less, willing to sign on to an ARP, which I can speak to later as well. Um, and, and so it just sort of raises a red flag. Um, again, speaking as a family doctor, um, my argument and the argument of many of my colleagues is that we need to actually be investing in primary care. So a government policy which de-invests from primary care, which hits family doctors hard, cuts their pay by a significant amount and demoralizes them at the end of the day is not going to save healthcare dollars. Um, so I will also send you some follow-up documents to support this, but numerous studies have shown that primary care is a cost-effective way of delivering healthcare and it improves mortality. So it saves lives. So people do better if they have a family doctor following their care versus if they don't. Um, so my argument would be that investing primary in primary care is what the government needs to be doing um, to actually save money. Um, and so their, their current strategy is actually doing the opposite. Um, and also simply put, less family doctors equals more um, um, emergency room visits and that can drive costs up. Um, I don't know, how, it's hard to actually get a number on how much an emergency visit costs, uh, but a, a basic clinic visit that's less than 15 minutes long costs $38. That's what a physician bills for that time. And an emergency visit is well over a thousand. I don't know the exact number. Now, granted, there are some fixed costs there, but there are also some variable costs. Now, the... Um, the government may argue that through encouraging ARPs, so these are alternative relationship plans, um, they are supporting primary care. So um, ARPs are a system where you get a salary and you need to have a certain number of patients and you're paid based on how complex they are. And I've attended information sessions about ARPs and very few physicians in Alberta actually use ARPs at this point. Um, so most people agree that ARPs can be a nice way to practice if you have a lot of complex patients. Um, but most people agree you make less money doing that. Now, personally, I'm a physician that I have a lot of complex patients. I book long appointments and typically I would be interested in something like this. However, um, given the actions of the government and the distrust that I have, and I know a lot of my physician colleagues have, I would not sign an ARP with this government. Um, there's no way. I would, I would prefer to continue with what I know than to sign an ARP with a government that I don't trust. Um, so that's the barrier there. Um, so in terms of, of what we're asking the provincial government, um, 
basically we're asking for them to return to the bargaining table with the Alberta Medical Association. So we are the AMA generalists and specialists alike. And we have um, worked through the AMA since time immemorial um, to come up with a plan where um, we have a pay structure with the government that everyone agrees upon. So the master agreement was canceled last year and there were some negotiations and then the negotiations just simply fell through. And up to this point, despite repeated requests, um, the government has not returned to the negotiating table uh, with the AMA. Um, there is a website called patientsfirst.ca and uh, my numbers are from two or three weeks ago, but at that time, over 11,000 emails had been sent in support of this issue. Um, so this is something that physicians and patients alike feel very strongly about. Um, with that, I will hand it over to, maybe we can leave that slide till the end. Thank you. And uh, I'll, I'll um, put it over to Dr. LaFontaine and then we'll come back to the end about um, how the city might be able to get involved in, uh, in this cause. Thanks, thanks Dr. Hudson. And, and thank you to uh, um, Mayor and, and councilors for providing some time tonight. Um, Dr. Hudson's talked about a lot of the, the topics. So I, I'm gonna mainly focus on something that I know is, is near and dear to all of you, which is retention and recruitment of physicians into this area, because you, you care about the strength of our rural health system. Um, and I'm going to keep it brief and just really direct. Uh, when you look at recruitment from the point of view of a physician, uh, we often look at incentives. So what are the reasons for moving somewhere? And we weigh whether or not one incentive outweighs another, or whether one's more important to us. And, and this goes far beyond you know just fiscal incentives. There's lots of reasons why I'm in Grand Prairie and have been in Grand Prairie for nine years that have very little to do with how much I make in my job. Um, I remember when I came here nine years ago that I had a colleague tell me that if you're here for longer than three, you'll probably stay for 30. Uh, it's been nine, going on 10 years now. And there's a lot of reasons why I fell in love with Grand Prairie. It reminded me of you know the, the rural town I grew up in Saskatchewan. The people are extremely friendly. I, I feel valued in the community. It's a place that I can make a good living and also live a good life. Um, now, if you look at retention, uh, retention is really about disincentives. And so how can you maintain the incentives that you had when you came here at a high enough level to not uh, disincentivize you to continue living there? And how can you avoid disincentives that make you think of leaving? So uh, when we look at disincentives that have happened since uh, I'd say kind of late 2019 with the passing of Bill 21, which enabled the government to unilaterally uh, withdraw from contracts with, with public sector uh, organizations, including the Alberta Medical Association. Um, you know, things like uncertainty, uh, fiscal disturbances that have direct impacts on operation, operating costs to the level where you actually start to think, you know, can I still afford to keep this place open while still uh, making enough to, to make it work you know, running this business. I, I know that's been something that lots of people have considered during this pandemic uh, as they've run small businesses. And I, I look at family doctors and specialists as, as small business owners as well. Um, and then there's also the, the way that we talk with each other. You know, for, for lack of a better word, I, I think there's been a lot of public shaming of physicians, you know, in response to um, some of the concerns that, that were brought up recently you know, there's the threat of, you know, releasing our salaries or our, our income, uh, which I think everybody who's on right now, we, we personally wouldn't have a problem with people because uh, we, we'd be able to talk about what we actually do in order to, to qualify for that income. Um, you know, uncertainty is a very strong disincentive for long-term investment in the community. And I think for someone who's lived here for nine years, going on 10 um, I can appreciate the importance of having people who've lived in the community, have invested in the community, uh, who don't just come in for work and then leave again. You know, so I, I think patients appreciate it. Uh, financial risk is a very strong disincentive to continue going on with, um, you know, operating small businesses. 
uh, I think that that's that's a huge risk that we're taking right now, especially when we're talking about cuts that that measure thirty percent that were restored, but because there is no contract and no legal recourse for us in case uh, those are brought back, which uh, I think is is a real risk, especially once this pandemic starts to wind down. Uh, I think people are, are very concerned about the viability of their business. And then, uh, you know, public shaming has really led to a disengagement between physicians and the government in particular. And uh, I, I think when I'm, I'm sitting here as a physician talking to you about uh, what kind of your role in all of this, what's, what's the role of, uh, you know, mayor and, and council, it's, uh, it's questions like asking, um, asking, and, and asking hard questions to government about uh, rural health care. You know, we, we know that it needs special attention when it comes to recruitment and retention. Uh, over the last 10 years that I've been here, uh, there's been five anesthesiologists that have left or that have come. You know, and I'm, I'm one of the only ones that is still here from that, that recruitment cohort, along with one that we, we just hired this past year. And, you know, removing uncertainty through removing the capacity for the government just to unilaterally do things. You know, physicians... Uh, would never argue that we're not in a tough fiscal situation, um, but we really just want to be treated fair. We want the same sort of capacity in order to reach uh, a mediation where everyone can can win and lose in, in equal ways. You know, uh, going in and, and creating a, you know an office environment, and then the next day realizing that 30% of the income that you've kind of mapped out over the next 12 months, like all of us do when we run small businesses, uh, suddenly has evaporated into the air. You know, that, that's not really Albertan in my, my opinion. You know, that, that's not the way that, uh, that the Alberta that I moved to and that I live in really, really is like. Uh, and then restoring that, that contract with the AMA. So uh, individuals like myself and Dr. Hudson and the other physicians uh, that are on the line right now, we can put down our head and just get to work. That, that really is, uh, I think, one of the things that I love about Alberta and rural Alberta in, in particular. It's not really a saying we have in rural Saskatchewan, but, you know, it's get her done. You know, we, we want to put down our head. We want to do our work. And at the end of the day, uh, we want to have some stability and certainty and feel appreciated. And so uh, thank you again for the time. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to turn the time back over to Dr. Hudson. Thanks, Dr. Lafontaine. Uh, okay, so we can go to the next slide and we'll uh, soon wrap up here. Um, so there, there's a, a slide here and uh, Dr. Lafontaine has, has um, spoke to this as well. Um, so how can you help? So obviously the city is not the province and uh, we have spoken to MLA uh, Allard and Taves as well. Um, so we have met with them. Um, but as the mayor and council, um, if you support uh, what we've spoken about this evening, um, advocating um, on our behalf and on the, really on the behalf of patients and residents of Grand Prairie would be one option. So engaging at the provincial level. And again, I've included that link to the patientsfirst.ca uh, website. And, and the, the main thing we're looking for at this point is a return to binding arbitration with the AMA. And, and I think that's quite reasonable. And Dr. Lafontaine spoke to this. It, it's not that physicians are not willing to take pay cuts, um, but we, we want it to be done fairly and in such a way that, that people can um, maintain viable businesses and, and continue similar to how they were continuing before if possible. Um, the mayor and I had also had a discussion talking about potential other ideas um, around uh, recruitment and retention. Um, and so there could be some other opportunities um, where the city could get involved. So, for example, um, uh, doing presentations down at the U of A or U of C and to just give Grand Prairie um, a face or a couple of faces can make a big difference. I know some people have said that it was because a physician came down and spoke that drew them to the area. Um, and then also to talk more about, well, how do we make Grand Prairie a city that's attractive to physicians? And uh, the mayor and I spoke about the, the wine and cheese event, which has been very well received. And we spoke about how I think myself and many of my colleagues 
um, feel that that's an event where we feel recognized. It's a nice chance. It's one of the only chances we get all year to socialize outside of work and as a larger group and uh, potentially looking at uh, further events like that. Because again, when someone's new, if you're in that first one or two years and you're a little isolated and you're not quite connected to the community, well, you may not stay in Grand Prairie. Um, but if you feel sort of welcomed by the community and you make some good connections, well, that, that can be part of the difference. Um, and perhaps that's something that we could um, discuss more at a private meeting down the road or, or something like that. Um, but, but just to give you a few ideas there. Uh, Dr. Lafontaine, do you have uh, any more comments or, or anything before you, we uh, poll for questions? No, no, I, I think turning the time over for, for any questions, and I, I don't know if it would be okay to invite any of the physicians who are on the line to maybe make a short statement if we have time, but I'll leave that up to you guys. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for that. I uh, appreciate it. We do have a number of uh, other physicians who've taken the time to be on the line. Um, and so maybe can we pull the, uh, the slide deck off the screen? Uh, that just actually gives me more screen real estate to be able to see who all is there. Thank you very much. And so maybe I'll just uh, be very brief. Uh, I'll ask, I'll call on some of the names that I can see and ask if they just care to give a brief sort of one minute hello. And uh, maybe you could speak to why you thought it was important to attend uh, this evening. Um, and uh, recognizing that you're all likely in support of the physicians here and uh, in respect of everybody's time, you don't need to go over them again. Um, but maybe first I'll call on, uh, I see Dr. Barty is uh, there, Dr. Barty, if you're uh, able to turn on your screen and your mic and just want to say a brief hello and why you chose to attend tonight. Hi, uh, I'm not gonna turn my, my screen on. I've got light behind me, so it's probably gonna glare on the screen. Um, we've been here, my wife and I are both physicians in town. We've been here for 17 and a half years. Um, really enjoyed our time in Grand Prairie. When we first came, we there was a, a recognition ceremony uh, when we came for our assessment. And there were multiple doctors who were recognized for 20, 25, and 30 years worth of service at that time. And everyone said to us, Grand Prairie is a great place to raise kids. We didn't have any at the time, but as time has gone on, we have four. And we definitely agree that it is a wonderful place to raise kids. Unfortunately, the government seems to be, especially the health ministry, seems to be very antagonistic towards the physicians at this time. There may be, you know, there's lots of talk of privatization, whether that be for financial gain or just to, you know, if something that's now publicly funded is going to be privately funded, it probably costs them less in the long run, but it ends up costing the patients more. Um, so the reason I attended was also just to, to put my support behind um, if the city council is able to to mobilize and to to um, in, encourage or just get the ear of someone in the government to get us back to the negotiate, negotiating table. Let's start this whole thing over again, but let's keep the, the great public health care that we have in Canada. Let's keep that going. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Barty. Um, I, I will move on. Uh, the next name on my screen is uh, Dr. Mock. Dr. Mock, if you'd like to turn on your microphone and or uh, screen and uh, just say hello and let us know why you're here tonight. Hi, uh, yes, thanks very much. Um, yeah, just to echo the same sentiments, uh, I've been here for nine years and Grand Prairie has been very good to you know, myself and my family. Uh, I phoned in mostly just to provide support to my family physician colleague. Um, <clears throat> today, at, um, I uh, performed a list of endoscopies and just as an example 20% uh, of my patients did not have a family physician from the Grand Prairie area and of those three patients uh, all three of them were over the age of 70 and they had complex care elements whether it be a cancer diagnosis uh, or multiple concurrent medical problems so I'm concerned when I hear of lots of family physicians leaving the city I worry about our especially senior population, that they'll lose their um, medical home. And a lot of these patients will ultimately rely on either walk-in clinics uh, or emergency departments to get their care, which, uh, as I think was stated earlier, uh, is not ideal for these complicated patients. So 
mostly just the support from my colleagues is what I wish to phone in for. Okay, thanks very much, Dr. Mock. Uh, Dr. Martin? Hi, it's actually Dr. Alex Noga. It's just that Brad owns the rights to this computer, I guess. But he's looking <laughs> into. Um, so I just sort of, again, uh, echo very much what Dr. Hudson and Dr. LaFontaine said. Uh, we're obviously the oldest ones here because we've been in Grand Prairie 29 years, both practicing as physicians, as family doctors. Um, and, and it is a great place to live and to bring up a family. Um, but again, much like they have said, uh, recruitment and retention are really big issues here. Uh, every day we get many phone calls, please, can you take another patient on? And of course, we all have limits. We just, we just can't do that. Um, and, and I think, I think uh, Dr. Hudson, Dr. LaFontaine pretty much mentioned everything. The only thing I wanted to mention that they maybe didn't mention is, you know, over a year ago before the contract even was torn up by the government, um, the AMA, we all took a 5% cut at that time. And when, when the government did briefly go to the negotiating table, the AMA offered another 5% cut. So again, as they said, we, we understand that Alberta is in a fiscal strain. We completely get that. We understand we're going to get cuts, but 30% um, would be very hard for anyone to maintain the business with that kind of cut. And just again, you know, Canada has a shortage of physicians. Rural areas have a shortage of physicians. People are not going to want to come to Grand Prairie if there's something much more lucrative elsewhere. They just won't. And so even though it's, it's certainly, there's much more to this than just money. Like a lot of what has been said is that we have just lost a certain amount of trust in the government. Um, but some of it is fiscal for sure. Anyway, thank you for listening to us. Thank you for making the time to be here tonight. Uh, Dr. Vandermeer. Uh, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, I'm, I'm Skalk van der Merwe. Um, I've been here since 2015. Um, yeah, and I just called in to also support Brienne and Dr. LaFontaine. Uh, I'm definitely one of the doctors that feel very discouraged and feel that I may want to leave the community. And I hope it doesn't have to go that way because I do love this community. I do love my patients, but I don't see any other way if things continue the way it's going. Yeah, but thank you for giving us this opportunity. Absolutely, thank you for attending. Um, and so I see um, one uh, one name on my screen says just iPhone. And so if you are, I don't know if you had another um, uh, member of your delegation or person who was here in support, but uh, I see two, uh, um, one person that's not a doctor, and I'll come to you, Mika, in a second, but uh, there's another one that's just listed as iPhone. I don't know if that's a member of administration or somebody who was here to uh, speak in support of the uh, physician's presentation. Uh, seeing that that's not coming on, then I'll just go to uh, uh, Mika. You're just like the rest of us. You're, you're, you're not a doctor, <laughs> uh, which, uh, but uh, I don't know if you wanted to speak to uh, just briefly again uh, why you attended this evening. Thank you. First, I attended because it's, a, it's quite flattering to be asked to attend something like this in support of, of something that we all feel so passionately about. And then I thought, well, I need to tease that out just a little bit, because when I think of complex needs, I don't always think about what all of those complex needs are. So I just wanted to identify that we're talking about people who have more than one or more than two issues, that sometimes language is a problem, sometimes poverty is a problem. And when we're looking at complex needs, we're looking at a large number of people who are involved with each individual. And I just wanted to say thank you to everybody who's attending this meeting, because without you, we wouldn't be anywhere. Let's keep the doctors in town. Okay, thanks very much, Mika. 
Well, I think that that's uh, everybody that I can see on screen. Um, Want to make sure that everybody did, that did attend had an opportunity to speak. Um, Dr. Hudson, I'll go to you for any closing comments um, before maybe I would, uh, actually, sorry, uh, before I ask you to close, I'll ask first, are there any questions from council uh, for our delegation? Councillor Thiessen? Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Given, and thank you very much, uh, Drs. Uh, Hudson and LaFontaine for your presentation for all the other doctors on the line listening here. Appreciate it. Uh, my question is, is in response to, uh, uh, I guess my, my question is when you, when you talk to uh, Tracy and Travis uh, uh, about uh, coming back to the bargaining table and the AMA's position, how well did they receive you? Um, did they, were they like, oh yeah, we'll talk about it? Or were they like, mm, well, decisions have been made. Um, were they open to potentially changing by your estimation? <clears throat> Um, I can speak to that. I, I mean, I think it can be a, a little bit difficult to tell. Um, but in the meetings, I thought both of them were open to what we had to say. Um, uh, Minister Allard said that she was going to do some background work and get back to us. So she, there was a level of engagement there. And uh, Minister Taves, who's also the Minister of Finance, um, asked some follow-up questions that I have sent to the AMA and I'm preparing a local response still and I'm also looking for a response from the AMA which they're working on and so we're going to communicate back so so I can say that there was um, some level of engagement so it, we we certainly weren't shut down um, but yeah it, it can be a bit hard to tell. Dr. Lafontaine I don't know if you'd like to comment as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'd say both of uh, both the MLAs are really good listeners, so that that should not come as a surprise to anybody. Uh, I will just add a little nuance to the government line that they want to hold the line at five point four billion for physician compensation. Uh, when when the contract was switched over at the hospital, um, they put out a call for contracts, and and what uh, the Ministry of Infrastructure was asking contractors to do was you know, finish off all the electrical or plumbing without knowing what was behind the walls. But you have to tell us how much it's gonna cost, no matter what it is, no matter what, what's behind those walls. And I, I think when we talk about the 5.4 billion and the real issue that physicians have in the negotiation of that is that we're being asked to shoulder growth, we're being asked to shoulder uh, complexity, we're being asked to shoulder uh, a lot of things that are completely beyond our control in the interest of cost containment. Now, will we work together to keep that as close to 5.4 billion as possible? Absolutely, same way as anybody that you'd hire as a contractor would, who wants to make sure that whatever you're working on together works out well. Um, but to expect people who run small businesses and you know work as contractors within the health system to shoulder the burden for population growth and all these other things, it, it's, it's too far beyond what I think is reasonable to expect. And I, I do think that anyone who, who kind of looks at it from the outside would, would probably agree with that. I, I think that's a message that really needs to be understood by, uh, you know, the people here on the call and also, you know, our patients. It's, it's not that we're not willing to hold the line like the government wants at that amount. It's just that we're taking on all that risk that if you were, an, you know, an electrician or plumber, uh, you would never sign on for a job like that. And so that, that's the only thing that I'll add. Okay, thank you. Very I might much. just say I might just say one more thing to that question is is um, yeah, I would say there was a level of engagement and I, I think having uh, the city get involved would only help that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I, I, I guess I'll just have a follow up here because um, largely in Grand Prairie we're in a pretty unique position that I don't know if we've ever been in before where we actually have the finance minister as one of our sitting MLAs and ministers. Um, so I'm really interested in how that conversation, like Tracy's great, like she's always like, yeah, I'll do what I can. So I, I love the community and she's, she's really good and she keeps her word and I, I really like that. Um, Travis, I don't know so much, but I mean, he does hold, he does hold the purse strings of the province. So um, did you find that maybe there was a bit of, there was a bit of, um, I don't know, uh, as you push, he like, he like went along with it and, and pulled and said, you know what, maybe there might be something we can do or did he intimate anything that they might change their course? Well, I think, see what had happened was I had attended his town hall prior to the meeting. 
and he had had mentioned a couple times that Alberta cannot no longer be the outlier. Alberta can no longer be the outlier, and so there was a big um, focus on the finances. And so it was helpful because I'll share these documents, but I came with two evidence reviews um, showing that investing in primary care actually saves money. And um, so that, again, it's very hard to tell, um, but he seemed um, at least open, open to hearing that. And um, he asked some follow-up questions as well. So that's, that's probably all I can say there. I yeah. will provide you with the same documents and, and I think it, it just brings it into a new light because making cuts in the wrong places, my argument is, is actually potentially gonna cost the system more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add to that, that I, I, think, I think any representatives, especially those within cabinet are in a tough position uh, because the government has decided what they wanna trust and what they don't wanna trust. And um, I think when you can't agree on kind of your sources of truth, you have to look at the impact instead. And so that, that's really what we're here for, is we're here to show you what the impact is. This has nothing to do with, you know, they said, we said, this is done by this person, that's done by that person. Uh, we're just physicians in the community telling you how it, it's affected us. And so um, I, I think that that's an enormous uh, support that the, that the city can provide, is we see the impact of this. And so you may not agree on what the facts are, but this is what the outcome is. Okay, thank you very much, doctors. I appreciate both both of your uh, responses and being here tonight. Thank you. Councilor Bressy. Great, thank you. I really appreciate you folks being here today. I know that I've talked to colleagues in municipalities across the province who some have faced a lot of cutback in their medical care and some are worried that's coming. So it's really useful and good to hear some local context. context. So thank you for that. Um, a couple of questions for you. The first one is, I'm just kind of curious how it works with doctors in terms of incentives to practice up here in the north. It's, I got to think that like many professions, if you've never been to Grand Prairie before, you haven't experienced it, it's a hard sell to go to Grand Prairie up in the north than to practice in Calgary or Edmonton. So what kind of incentives are in place for doctors for northern practice and have those been impacted at all by this government? Dr. Hudson, why don't you talk about family physicians, then I'll talk about specialists. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, so um, so the more rural you are, so there's a few incentives. So the more rural your community is, you get an extra percentage onto the money that you make, and it caps at 60000 a year. Um, so in Grand Prairie, that number is about 16%. And um, that was one of the, the things that was going to be cut um, with the changes. And um, actually, I, to be honest, I haven't even double checked if we're getting that back yet. I don't know if any of my other colleagues can weigh in there. Um, maybe they can afterwards. So, so that, was, um, that was something that was at risk. Uh, the other thing, and so if you're up in high level, it's something like 30%. If you're in Edmonton, it's 0%. So you do get paid more to work rural. Um, and the other thing is there, there can be signing bonuses as well. So if you commit to three years and you commit to a, doing a certain type of work in a community, uh, you can get a certain amount of money for that. Now that amount of money is decreasing. So when I was in medical school, you would commonly hear that someone would get a $100,000 signing bonus for three years. And to be honest, you know, cause I've been here for nine years, I don't know that they're still doing that. Um, yeah, and if they are, the numbers would be reduced. And again, I don't know if any of my colleagues can weigh in on that, but, but there are no $100,000 signing bonuses anymore. Um, so where is the incentives um, to, to work rural used to be quite good for Alberta, and that did attract a number of physicians. Um, those are certainly dwindling. So Brianne, yep. uh, it's, it's Alex Noga here. So the, the remote Northern and business cost program are all gone by March of 2021. Um, there you go. Yeah. So those are going to be gone. 
Thank you. I'm As sorry, well, what was called again? Uh, rural Remote Northern Program, uh, RRNP. Great, thank you. Yeah. And then if I may, Mayor, are given one more question. Um, then my other question is just, to, uh, I think that advocacy is is great and I definitely, I'm looking forward to council discussion on if and how we can potentially do that. But I'm also intrigued by these other ways that the city can help with attraction retention. I'm just curious, what's the, what's the best way? I don't want the city to go out and do a whole bunch of things that aren't gonna be effective and you're the folks that know what would be effective. So what's the best way for us to have that conversation with you in terms of what more could we be doing? You know, I, I would say in the current environment, having a public statement just saying you support doctors. Um, it doesn't need to commit to certain actions, but just a public statement that you value the doctors in your community um, and that you support them as they try and figure this out in this difficult fiscal environment. I mean, a, a statement like that is actually really, really meaningful to us, um, especially those of us who, who've been here for a longer period of time. Um, there's There's other things that you can advocate for. I, I think it's pretty clear that some people come here for, for fiscal reasons and stay here for very, very different reasons. Um, I know that was that weighed into my consideration when I came up here. Um, and then also making statements about the importance of uh, having all of these incentives in some sort of centralized location. One, one of the things that uh, I'll do expand on what Dr. Hudson said is, you know, we, we have these signing bonuses, we have, uh, you know, moving allowances, we have uh, you know, assistance with our medical legal costs, which in Canada, we've kind of spun off into its separate thing while in the US, they, they put it into their fees. That's one of the reasons why fees are so expensive in the States is because medical legal is included within those fees versus up here. Um, you know, one by one, those programs have been pulled out from, you know, our, our Alberta Medical Association and brought into Alberta Health. Mm. You know, and these are very complex programs that have very specific pain points and if not administered properly, don't do their intended, uh, don't have their intended impact. And so uh, little by little, you'll see more and more of these programs announced by Alberta Health that were originally administered by the AMA. Uh, and I just worry like there's 14,000 physicians in, in Alberta, you know, AHS has a difficulty managing the contract it has right now. And now you're gonna add all of the physician contracts and the problems into their you know, and suddenly Dr. Hudson will get a different deal than Dr. Martin, which will get a different deal than Dr. LaFontaine, when really what we want is just consistency and fairness. You know, we want to be collaborative with, uh, with our different groups. And so uh, maybe advocating for, you know, some centralized, fair way of working through these programs and, and keeping them in a place where we can make sure that the intent ends up having its impact. Yeah, and I would add to that by saying it, it is a bit difficult in the setting of COVID. So, I mean, I think like the wine and cheese night was something that, that was great and potentially doing something like that um, quarterly or something, for example, if that were possible. And, and it's something I want to put a little more thought into myself as well, but just sort of creating those opportunities for physicians to socialize together um, and, you know, with counsel, potentially with other professionals and just sort of create opportunities for uh, physicians to be a part of the community, which I think many of us here do, but when you're looking at the new docs that are kind of deciding, am I going to set down roots here or not, um, community can really make a big difference in terms of what they decide. Um, the other thing you could do would be to poll physicians. Now, sending out an email, you're probably not going to get a lot of responses, but one example would be like we have our PCN annual general meeting uh, on July 28th, and we have other PCN, so that's primary care network, so that's for family physicians, and those tend to be relatively well attended, and say you had a piece of paper um, now, again, if we're having a virtual meeting, that makes it more tricky, but at least we could advertise it at the meeting. And if you wanted a questionnaire and give an opportunity for physicians to respond at a time when they have time to respond, that could potentially be an idea. Thank you. Okay. I see Councillor Clayton. Thanks, Mayor Gibbon. Uh, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, it's uh, very useful information. I think that uh, 
this council and prior councils have taken a strong position as well as the Chamber of Commerce in regards for advocating for rural doctors and, and doctor retention and attraction. Um, it's been, I know it's been a past priority of councils as well as the Chamber. Um, I just wanted, you mentioned something in regards to um, sort of a social setting. Um, as you mentioned, you're all small business owners in, in some sort of format. I would strongly suggest that if you're not members of the Chamber of Commerce, that you get involved with the Chamber of Commerce. It's not only a good way to meet uh, other professionals and business owners, it's an opportunity for you to get involved with an organization that lobbies for businesses. So uh, it, it would be a great opportunity, um, you know, as, as small business owners for you to get involved there as well. I think that, uh, um, I can absolutely get behind uh, attention and retraction attraction strategies. Um, I struggle a little bit with getting involved in in the um, this council discussion in regards to your binding arbitration agreement, um, but I think that this council. Uh, and past councils have been very supportive on other elements in regards to uh, what we can do to support doctors, so I thank you for coming tonight. Thanks, Councillor Clayton. Uh, any other questions for the delegation before we let them go? Councillor O'Toole. Yes, thank you very much for uh, being here tonight and uh, giving us your side of the story. Uh, it's not uh, manipulated by media or anything like that. And uh, once again, uh, the, our council, the last few councils, have been uh, pretty uh, supportive of the physicians both in retaining them and uh, acquiring positions in the local Grand Prairie area. So you got my support and uh, we'll see what we can do here for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Councilor O'Toole. Um, I don't see any other uh, questions. Uh, so maybe I'll just uh, add my thanks uh, to each of you for presenting and uh, helping inform council and your colleagues uh, that joined as well to demonstrate their support and also help uh, increase our understanding. Certainly appreciate the time that you've taken. Um, and uh, thank, you, thank you very much for coming to a city council meeting. Um, as uh, boring as this might be on online, um, they're way more fun in person. Um, and hopefully we can get back to those days soon. But thanks very much for being here this evening to, to share uh, some perspective on this important issue. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Okay, um, so with our uh, delegation portion of our agenda closed and people popping off screen, um, we have no public hearings this evening. Um, that does take us to delegation business. And I don't know whether uh, council is in a position to um, have any action arising from this, um, but I'm open to hearing and uh, it would also be reasonable if it was something that we wanted to think a little bit about before taking any actions to. Councilor Bressy, then Councilor Blackburn. Great. Well, thank you. I look forward to the discussion about what actions we can take and when to time those. But one I heard, um, one I, one request I heard that I think makes a lot of sense and is also really easy to is just a public statement of affirmation of the importance of physicians. And so I would move that uh, before we talk about the other actions we want to do, I'd move that council affirm that our local physicians are valued members of our community who are vital to our health, economy, and way of life. And it's just a way in a counselee's way to just say we really do appreciate and love our physicians and we're so glad that we've got each and every one of them. Okay, thanks, Council Bressy, uh, for that motion. Uh, any discussion or debate on that motion? Seeing none, then I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Okay. And any opposed? I see none opposed. Uh, Councillor Blackburn, I just want to make sure that, uh, did you get Councillor Blackburn's vote, Arlene? No? Okay. Uh, Councillor Blackburn, uh, do, were you in support of that motion? It looks like you may uh, have a bandwidth. Yeah, my internet froze on me during the vote, but I am in favor. Thank you. And then, uh, so that motion does carry uh, unanimously. And then Councillor Blackburn, you also had your hand up uh, prior to Councillor Bressy's motion. Yes, thank, thank you, Mary Given. I, I just wanted to, uh, to say that uh, regardless of what we may do as a council, um, something that I'm moved to do as a result of what we heard tonight is to uh, personally write to um, our local MLAs and possibly to the, to the uh, Minister of Health as well, um, is that 
not only do we appreciate and support our local physicians, but um, I fear the risk of losing them. And rather than getting to specifics about what they might do about that, I simply want to ask them to stop doing the things that make doctors want to consider leaving and, and leave it at that. Okay, fair enough. Thanks, Councillor Blackburn. Um, are, is there any other uh, business arising or consideration council wish to make on this issue before we move on? Councillor Bressy? Yeah, um, I'll try another motion. And that's, I'd like to move that, uh, that I'd move to the council direct the mayor to write to ministers, to Minister Taves and MLA Allard requesting a meeting with council to discuss healthcare in our community. And to talk about this, I think healthcare is a vital thing in our community. I think that this is, this is a topic I've been following that is very concerning to me. Also today we passed a motion in terms of writing the premier about mental health in our community. We've also got a new hospital that's opening up and one of the next big stages of that is recruitment of not just physicians, but all the other professionals. And I think it would be worthwhile getting an update on where that is. I just think that there's a lot of things in the health portfolio going on in our community. And I know I'd appreciate hearing from our MLAs and our representatives in the legislature how they think things are going and how we can help them in their work on behalf of our community. Okay, okay. thanks for that motion, Councillor Bressy. Uh, I see Councillor Clayton. Yeah, I just ask that um, consideration be given to the fact that there are many other topics as well that we may want to discuss uh, when we have an opportunity to sit down with both, both of our local MLAs um, and that the meeting be not only restricted to this discussion. Sure, go ahead, Councillor Bressy. So maybe if you'd permit me to make a friendly amendment, I definitely think that healthcare in my mind is the most important topic in our, in our community right right now, but I appreciate that there's more. So maybe I, I'd amendment to say requesting a meeting to discuss healthcare and other important topics of our community. So I'd still like to make clear that we want to talk about healthcare in that motion, but yeah, sure, I'd, it'd be a shame to limit ourselves. Yeah, sure, thanks very much. Um, uh, good luck trying to keep this council from talking about whatever they want to talk about. <laughs> by the way. Uh, um, no, I, so I support the motion um, also because I, I, I think one, it flags that uh, City Council is, is interested in learning more about the system of healthcare. We have concerns um, about a bunch of different issues. Um, this one in particular, uh, we want to learn more about and hear, um, you know, the province's view of the issue. Uh, that will allow us to be more informed and decide what other actions we might take down the road. And so, uh, yeah, certainly support the motion. Any other discussion or debate? Councillor Thiessen. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Given. Uh, I'll 100% fully support uh, Councillor Bressy's motion. Uh, it sort of uh, piggybacks off of my questions to our doctors about uh, our MLAs locally. Um, and that's a conversation that we, we always have open to us and that we should take advantage of. And Councillor Bressy's right. Um, uh, I'd like to talk to them about other priorities within the city. There's always lots of moving pieces here and always ways that we can work with our provincial counterparts. But at this time and day and age, uh, health matters are what are most important. Uh, one of the things I didn't know uh, was that the contract for a radiologist was canceled. So that just means potential for privatization uh, that was showed in that. So, I mean, there are things that I think we need to at least have discussions on. And if there's a way to correct course or to recourse or even to, you know, give us their explanation so we have a better understanding of it. Uh, those are conversations that I want to have so that I can judge with my own eyes and fully support our doctors and physicians. And I think, uh, you know, losing 10 is a huge is a huge blow to our community over the past year. And I want to actually see 20 or 30 more in the next five years or, or more, uh, whatever that'll allow. So uh, having that conversation with our MLAs is good. Uh, and I would personally like to, you know, Set up, set aside most of the time to talk about the, the health concerns in our community, the Grand Prairie Regional Hospital, and other stuff. So, thanks, Councillor Bressy, for making that motion. I fully endorse it. Thanks, Councillor Thiessen. Councillor Minhas. Thank you, Mayor Wilgo. I supported 100% on this motion because we needed to talk with good to locally MLA and our finance minister. But I'd like to add a, a health minister too. She's very good. Uh, I haven't talked a few times. She will understand more situation if we can add her into that letter. If uh, we can do the, I don't know if we need the amendment or not, but I'd rather have involved her too in this situation because I'm quite a bit concerned about recruiting the doctors and we losing the doctor. 
just another issue is definitely you know like they, they cut down the cut back they can negotiate that word part but we needed something to more progress progressive way and the aggressive way to bring the doctor and be opening up the new doc a new hospital so i i'm 100 supportive of this motion too okay well and and you know there may be a number of other entities or people or individuals or cabinet members that we'd want to talk to maybe this is a starting point for us to get the views of our two local MLAs and then council be more informed and decide what other actions we might take from there so. any any other discussion or debate on councilor bressy's motion seeing none then i'll call for the vote all those in favor Thank you. And I'll just check Councillor Blackburn. We didn't see a move on screen. There you go. That I'm taking that as an in favor. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, then we will go to uh, council member reports. Uh, council, I know we've had a long meeting day. Um, so what I will do is I will just sort of go in order on my screen and I'll ask if you have any reports from external agencies, boards and commissions. Um, Councillor Blackburn, do you have any external reports? No, I do not. Councillor O'Toole, do you have any extra external reports? Just a short one, Mayor Gibbon. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Um, the Community Futures of Grand Prairie and Region just held their age, uh, their uh, audit. We had an audit presentation, and uh, it looked uh, very good. And the auditors were quite pleased with uh, the uh, the quality of the work that's being done. At community futures by our staff so it was a difficult audit just because it was done uh, virtual and uh, so a lot of copying and pasting and sending stuff out but uh, as it goes it went uh, it went quite well so thank you very much okay thank you Councillor O'Toole I see that Councillor Clayton uh, had nothing to report and needs to exit so thanks Councillor Clayton um, Councillor Minhas any external reports no, I don't have anything. Thank you. Councillor Bressy. Councillor Friesen. Uh, nothing to report. Thanks, Mayor Given. Councillor Thiessen. Thanks, Mayor Given. Uh, nothing really to report, except I'm going to put some work on your desk because I got to put some work on my desk. Uh, the handoff of the proverbial football is happening with the Mighty Peace Watershed Alliance. I just received word uh, this morning uh, from Rhonda Clark Coche that uh, our AGM is coming up. And as per our discussions in the past, uh, I will be handing the ball off to Councillor Bressy to, to sort of fill my shoes. Uh, I'll be second alternate to Michelle Gardner from Environmental Stewardship. Uh, but uh, I have to write a letter to officially resign uh, for the AGM. And that means, Mayor Given, you have to write a letter to officially endorse Councillor Bressy. So that's all I have to report. Thanks. Thanks for the heads up. That's something that doesn't happen all that often. So thank you for the reminder. Um, I uh, didn't have anything to report. Um, and so then I'll just do one call to see if there are council members that had any external meetings uh, or events that they wanted to report on. Councilor Bressy, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Given. Um, I did think I, I thought I'd give you folks an update on the opioid response task force. We had a meeting this morning and um, two things to highlight. One, talking about our quarterly our quarterly reports that have statistics of overdose in the community. And in Alberta, uh, we've had quarter one reports, which really just hit pre-COVID. We haven't in Alberta, we don't have data for quarter two yet showing the impacts of COVID, but some early numbers are coming out of other jurisdictions uh, in Canada. And they're scary. They're showing anywhere from 25% to 93% increase in fatal overdoses in other jurisdictions. And talking to our providers here, though that might not be too far off the mark of what we're gonna see in Alberta. There's a bunch of factors. There's the mental impact that COVID's taking on everybody. There's uh, the, as China's had issues and supply chains of everything, including illicit <coughs> exchange. There's a lot more contaminated uh, a lot more contaminated uh, batches. Their serves been a huge factor where people getting a big injection of cash. Uh, some of them don't make good choices with that. And sometimes that has tragic, tra tragic results. And what's really kind of scary here in Grand Prairie is that our providers, they're reporting that the people who are overdosing here are 
people are completely unknown to them. The people with the traditional complex needs who are involved in agencies, they're not overdosing. It's new people that we don't know if they're transient to the community or we don't know if there are people that just don't usually access services, but the overdoses that we're seeing locally aren't known to our organizations, which is, which is scary that a lot more people are probably struggling and we don't know who they, who they are. Uh, so it, that, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't a fun meeting to get an update from our service providers. Um, also just to give you folks a head up, heads up, I think that the task force is going to pivot its pivot its mandate a little bit and we're thinking we're going to do it a little bit differently in terms of kind of what it's become is a monthly meeting of frontline of very frontline social support agencies ahs rcmp northreach sunrise house all of those and it's become very much a working group and there's been a recognition that that very much is needed and that collaboration has been very valuable and didn't and didn't exist before in grand prairie so very grateful it's there but also there's a whole bunch of organizations that are very important in our fight against opioids uh, that need to be at the table, such as school boards, such as downtown associations, such as um, worker associations, that we wanna have more of a conversation with them, but also they're not interested, rightly so, in coming to a monthly working meeting. And so I think where the task, where the task force is thinking it might take itself is uh, becoming a larger task force that involves all these other organizations in a three or four time a year meeting, and then has working subcommittees that work in between. So trying to, so we're trying to figure out how to get that wider community involvement. And over the summer, we'll be working on new terms of references that, uh, that we'll be looking at as, a, at as a task force in September. And then if we do say that those are the terms of reference we want, we'll make sure to loop you folks in too. But just be aware that it's pivoting. And while we're pivoting, if you've got thoughts of organizations that we should be inviting to take part, please be sending them my way. Because as soon as we approve new terms of references, we're, we're gonna wanna hit the ground hard on recruiting. Great, thanks very much, uh, Councillor Bressy. Any other uh, updates on external meetings or events? Councillor Friesen. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Gibbon. Um, Canada Day went, uh, very differently this year. We had it, uh, of course, a couple of days later than the actual day because of weather. And uh, I got to spend some time at the parade with Councillor Bressy and then uh, Councillor Clayton came as well. And it was um, just great to see how many people came out to drive past the parade floats, if you will. So it was really a, a reverse parade and, and very different, but no less enjoyable. Um, to be there and to see a lot of Grand Prairie coming out uh, and uh, yeah just the the um, other events down at the park and just seeing things uh, open up and um, and the summer events begin is pretty exciting so uh, I really enjoyed uh, Canada Day and uh, and it was great seeing a lot of you drive past. Thanks Councillor Friesen. Councillor Blackburn? Thank you Mary Gavin. Uh, I hope that I don't freeze up too often going through this. But I just wanted to mention a community event that's really important to the city, and that is uh, the Street Performers Festival, which for the last time, 19 years has been very good for, uh, for our city and for our downtown. And uh, so coming up on our 20th anniversary, it's unfortunate that we're not able to have a festival in the streets. However, we are having a festival and it's going to be happening online. And um, I would encourage folks to tune in uh, between July 17th and the 22nd to, uh, to take part in, in this festival and to, uh, and to enjoy uh, the return of a number of performers who have been with us in the past um, for this uh, 20th anniversary uh, sort of online reunion of, of performers. Thanks, Councillor Blackburn. Uh, I'm sure the community is still looking forward to it and obviously a huge milestone for the festival. It's great to see that even through this time, it's continuing. Uh, any other updates? Um, Councillor Thiessen? Thank you very much, Mayor Given. Uh, the last two weeks of mine has been filled with uh, so many coffee dates. People are looking for new ways. Uh, some of them have been very interesting. Uh, one was a uh, very very in-depth discussion about uh, 5G and the impact, the health impacts and the potentials of that and uh, how they might bring it towards council's attention. So 
give you little pointers to potentially a future delegation. Uh, also, the Traditional Path Society uh, came and uh, wanted to talk about what they do and their need for space. Um, so uh, I sort of coached them into maybe becoming a delegation and making that request. Uh, they weren't looking for funding. They're just looking for places that, um, that they could gather people culturally and do arts and crafts and keep people out of trouble largely and really immerse them into uh, the First Nations, uh, First Nations, Métis and in Indigenous populations and their culture. Uh, finally, I just really want to pump up uh, July 8th. I was, again, really, really blessed to be able to do another video shoot for GP Grows. Uh, big thanks to uh, Nikki, uh, Michelle, Amy, and Ashley uh, for all the help there. I was holding a boomstick. Former counselor Lauren Radburn popped by and got to watch some of the show. It was great. We were teaching people how to thin out their garden, what to look for when you're trying to make sure you get good carrot growth. Uh, Swiss chard beets, and we talked a bit about the radishes that uh, Director Glavin uh, talked about uh, at our last council meeting, with our, or at, I guess our last committee meeting with the updates, and how we donated all of our radishes to the Friendship Centre and their food program. So whatever's coming out uh, of the ground is going back into the community and into people's bellies, which is a great thing. Uh, there was a bit of discussion, though, that uh, when it comes time for harvest, we may have to uh, reach out to schools or to not-for-profits uh, in order to collect all this food, uh, since we planted lots of gardens and we got lots of orchards and stuff like that. So really good. I encourage people to watch the first uh, how to do video that uh, just uh, hit the Facebook social media here uh, late last week. And this next one will be coming out, I'm sure, in another week or two as well. So that's all I got to report. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Councillor Thiessen. Um, if there was anything else... Um, I'll just very briefly say that uh, I was uh, representing Eagle May on two different committees that would be of interest uh, to Council. Uh, one was the Alberta Interim Police Advisory Committee. Uh, this is the uh, interim committee that the province struck to deal with the new funds that are being generated by the um, new police funding framework. Uh, so that committee had its first in-person meeting in Edmonton. Uh, my first in-person meeting outside of the city in a long, long time. Um, but uh, the committee started to set up its work because we have a number of deliverables uh, in terms of providing input into the province on the RCMP's multi-year business plan, uh, as well as the um, um, dedication of new resources, basically how the province is going to start to use the money that it's collecting. Um, and then also we're charged with uh, setting up the governance structure of the police advisory committee. Uh, so we are intended to be in term for a period of time. Uh, before we hand that off. Uh, I'm there as a representative of the AUMA board along with some other board members. Uh, I think ultimately, uh, you know, my intent would be that the representatives on that committee would be from those communities that are now having to pay for policing. Um, but I uh, thought council might be interested in that. Um, and then also uh, the alert civilian advisory committee uh, had a brief uh, online meeting uh, to review the alert 2020 to 2023 business plan and provide some input into the alert board of directors. And uh, so those aren't city of Grand Prairie um, uh, meetings uh, that I was attending, but obviously relevant to our city and uh, thought I would report back to, to council to let you know uh, some of the work that I do as a part of um, my AUMA uh, board duties um, that all of you so graciously support me in. And so I uh, thank you for that and hopefully I'll be able to bring back value to, to the city. Um, with that, I think uh, we'll call our meeting adjourned. Thanks very much. Everybody.